was saying at the beginning, you know, uh, my story is so typical of so many people in the United States, yes. you know, who come from immigrant parents and you sort of work your way through college and you go to dramatic school and you are fortunate enough to go into the kind of work that you'd like to do and it's, it's sort of a, but, what I call a corny American story. But nonetheless, too, I mean, there's poor and poor, isn't there? There's poverty, poverty and poverty. Well, I mean, how poor were you? Were your well, I don't want to... You know, I'm afraid Dick Emery, if he's listening, would, you know, feel very uh, humiliated. Because, you know, my wife once said to me, you know, Kirk, one of these days you're going to be shattered because you might meet someone who was poorer than you. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yes, I, I came from, I guess, Michael, what you'd call abject poverty. If not having enough to eat, you know, days where you didn't have food, I guess that's, that's poor. You were hungry poor? Yes, hmm. yeah. And, uh, and, and, and something, as a matter of fact, that's uh, intriguing, because I don't think there's any reason for anyone really in the world to be hungry poor. And I think that hopefully someday some of our politicians in our country or other countries would certainly work out a way where there's no reason really for anyone ever mm. to be hungry poor. Mm. Yes. But you were one, you were the only boy, weren't you, in a family of six girls. That's right. I don't envy you that. Make weird. something of that. Yeah, well, <laughs> I was going to ask you to make something of that. <clears throat> well, uh, of course, I think that's quite difficult. You know, I not only had uh, six sisters and my mother, that's seven women, but my father and mother separated uh, at an early age. And uh, that left me with seven women, which I think was a, a very difficult upbringing, and I found going to college was really a form of escape. I found the environment really kind of smothering. Yes. And, uh, you know, I had mixed feelings. Why did I leave my father, who, by the way, was quite a, a character. He was a very powerful man, a peasant. Uh, he, he also drank a lot, which I think is a form of escape. And I've often thought that one of the bravest moments in my life was one day I was just a, I don't know, I was about 10 years old. We were all sitting around the table. My six sisters, my mother and I, and my father was sitting, one of the rare moments that he was with us, and we were drinking tea in that time out of a glass, Russian style, you know, and my father was breaking off a piece of sugar and <sighs> sipping the tea through, and everybody was frightened of him. He was just overpowering him, and he was in a mean mood. And I don't know why, suddenly I took a spoon, and I took it into the, filled it with the hot tea, and I flicked it right in <laughs> Well, I tell you, he grabbed me and he threw me, but I just felt so, I felt I did it, you know, and it, and it sounds strange, but that is so vivid in my mind, and it's almost, it was, it's almost like an act that I feel saved me, that I dared to do something, yeah. and when you're that young, you think, you know, you, you actually think you're risking your life. Thank you very much. I'm, as you know, Kirk Douglas. <laughs> now, now, you people know I'm not, but there's heavy squinting going on in the balcony. There's heavy everything going on in the balcony. Anyway, you know I'm not Kirk Douglas. How could there be a talk show host named Douglas? Oh, wait. There, there, anyway, uh, very good to see you. I, I'm back now. I'm two days from my vacation. And it's much... Vacations are nice, but work is better. How many believe my sincerity there? 
You did? Some of you... Really? <laughs> My uncle, the used car dealer, will now pass among you to get your names. That's, there you go. Uh, it's nice. Hey, speaking of cars, this is an odd thing in the news. Sterling Moss has had his driver's license taken away. Did you see that? For six months for a traffic violation, the great race driver. Absolutely true. That's terrible. He cannot, that's like taking away Van Cliburn's piano or, 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 or Heifetz's violin or, or Rosengarden's frisbee or uh, I don't know what, I can't tell you what it's like. Say, one of our highly decorative secretaries is leaving. She quit today. She said that she's been made to feel like a dummy around the office. And she's just leaving, the end of June or the first of July, whichever comes first. <laughs> just a joke. Say, are you out from out of town, any of you? From out of town? You'll be glad to know, yeah. The Commissioner of Health has said that all New York beaches are safe this summer. It's the ocean that's polluted. Uh, <laughs> Do you know the lifeguards are on strike? They still are, yeah. But some of them are showing up for work anyway, out of, you know, conviction and all in there. So if you are swimming and you begin to drown, and a guy swims out and grabs you and says, are you for labor or management? Uh, <laughs> you know what to say. What else? There's not much in the news. The Wall Street Journal actually had this item that the, what do they call them? Uh, what's that company called? Uh, uh, the Playtex company. Yeah. It has a campaign out against the no bra look and they've actually hired an agency and all. Did you read about That's true. I make that up. I, no, I have a suggestion for a patriotic slogan for them. Support our girls at the front. <laughs> <laughs> no good. All right. Listen, you know who my guest is, and I want to hurry to get to him, because there's a lot to him. And, uh, but now, here's how to make a lot of things taste better in a shake. We'll be back with Kirk Douglas. Stay with me. My only guest tonight is uh, a real movie star, fine movie actor. Kirk Douglas is, I guess he's been part of our lives for about a generation and, and more. And... Uh, had an astonishing career and played an astonishing variety of characters. Uh, just to refresh your memory, he led a slave rebellion in the Roman Empire. He ran a mythical crime syndicate. He sneered in the face of beautiful ladies. He has sometimes just uh, flexed his dimpled chin. He has managed to get in harm's way. Uh, had his face slashed ostentatiously. He stared down the Cyclops with one eye closed. He shot it out at the OK Corral. He liberated Norway from the Nazis. He was uh, part of a mutiny in the French army in the other world war, and he went to the south of France to paint, covered his dimple and lost his ear, and uh, got up off the floor to become the world's champion. You know, of course, that I'm talking about the incredible Debbie Reynolds, Kirk Douglas, right here. Ladies and gentlemen, you know, it's, it's really, doing something like this is really very difficult. Hmm. A lot of people don't realize that uh, for an actor, he feels very secure behind that montage of photos that you were showing. Then you're yeah. playing a role, you've got wardrobe, you've got a part to hide behind. But when you come out like this, you really feel completely naked because you have to be yourself. But I want to confess one thing to you. I must say that Dick Cavett is very helpful because just before I went on, he told me that, he says, look, just to remind you, the chair you sit in is the one that I'm not sitting in. So, <laughs> I, well, I, I guess I tend to treat actors like dummies. I exactly. Guess. I didn't mean to. As uh, a matter of fact, I want to interrupt you again, Dick. You know, you said, <laughs> you said on your... It's uh, hard for him, but easy for me tonight. <laughs> you know, you said, uh, I was listening, it was very amusing, and you were jokingly saying you were Kirk Douglas. Now, yes. on my way to the theater tonight, I was rushing, because I love to walk in New York. And uh, I was a little late, so I was walking rather fast, and somebody from across the street yelled to me, hey! And he ran across, and he said, gee, my favorite actor. And I said, thank you, I'm in a little hurry. He said, you know, I'm so excited and so nervous. He said, your name went right out of my mind. 
Well, I said, uh, <laughs> my name's Douglas. Yeah, he says, Douglas Fairbank's my favorite actor. <laughs> So it's very important when you say, you know, it's very important yeah. when you say, uh, when you say who you are. Yeah. You know, and you, but you do have a beard, though, and so uh, there's a little confusion there, I mean, as to whether it's actually you well, or not, because the... Uh, if I wear a beard, Dick, it's because uh, I'm going to be, I'm either mm -hmm. just going out of a picture or going into another one. Yeah. Or, right now, I'll be going into a picture that calls for a beard, and I can't I stand, you know, one of those false... Yeah. False I feel I should ask someone of your stature uh, an important question right off the bat, and um, so I will. Carol Burnett was here last night and wanted to know how you clean your dimple <laughs> in, in your chin. And, 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 uh, Dick. No, I, I, Dick. I, Burnett. Dick. Wanted, yes. Yes, Mr. D. <laughs> Is nothing sacred? No, I. I, I mean, <laughs> I want to get that out of the way right away because... I mean, must there be no secrets between me and me? Well, I, I thought we'd get that out of the way because she as wanted a, to know. Her heart you know, seemed set on it, the uh, silly girl. As a, matter, <laughs> as a matter of fact, in a picture I did once with Kim Novak, mm -hmm. that was one of the lines where she kept staring at me. I said, yeah. what's the matter? She says, how do you shave that? Yeah. Well, the answer's in that picture, Dick. So, uh, <laughs> go back and see the movie, and I'll know, I'll know yeah. the answer. There have been all sorts of rumors about it, like something <laughs> something lives in there and all sorts of <laughs> strange things. And I know you're sick of that. No, so, no. Hey. As a matter of fact, someone once said that there's a little midget with a straight razor who jumps down there and cleans <laughs> it out. I, I, I'd believe it. Uh, but it is isn't. I'm sorry we can't see it, because uh, I, I saw your film last night. We'll talk about that later, but it, it is quite a phenomenon, the, the chin. It's, uh, it's there. It's the most... It's, uh, as a matter of fact, it's not really a dimple. Let's face it, it's what? a hole in the chin. Is it really? It's, yeah. <laughs> is it really? Well, is it? Well, I don't know. I mean, I know that if we could see it, it would be the most cleavage we've had on the show in a long time. <laughs> uh, but enough of that. Now that's over. You know, when you say, is it really, one day I was riding to... Uh, Palm Springs, I have, a, I have a home in Palm Springs, and I was in a little car, and a sailor was, uh, was hitching a ride, and I stopped, and I picked him up, and he looked at me, and he got very excited, and he said, Hey, do you know who you are? <laughs> Did he? <laughs> he wanted uh, to that, share something. That is, a, people cannot believe sometimes, when they, well, especially a face like yours. Can you go anywhere? Can you, can you go in and buy a spool of thread, for example, and have the <laughs> lady in the dime store not... Well, no, the last who, time who I are. bought a spool of thread, no one recognized well, me. <laughs> <laughs> hey, something we got past, we, oh, I thought we ought to do this now. You'd mentioned Kim, Kim Novak and um, all the leading ladies that you've done. There's a, a bit of film that's been sort of assembled that shows the incredible number of women who've passed through your hands well, you know, in the uh, <laughs> years. You see, Dick, you know, most people have a, a distorted idea, you know, of a movie actor. I mean, it all seems rather simple, but a lot of people don't realize. For example, if I do, like I worked recently in a picture with Faye Dunaway. Mm -hmm. Now, an actor, I'd have to get up in the morning about 6.30, take a shower, rush through my breakfast, jump in the car, go down to the studio, get into wardrobe and makeup, and then at 9 o'clock in the morning, under those hot lights, I'd have to start making love to Faye Dunaway hour after hour oh. after hour. And these are the things that uh, <laughs> actors have to do. <laughs> It's, it's awful, but it beats unemployment, I think. <laughs> could, could we roll that, uh, that bit of, uh, of film? Take a look at this. Oh, the mics will stay open. Um, see how, what Let's memories see. this brings back. Uh, these are the, uh, films of people yeah. that I've worked. Yeah, ladies. Uh, yes. Ladies oh, this is a, a picture I did, Bad and the Beautiful, with Lana Turner. It's one of the first times I played a love scene. And look how tenderly I hold her. This, is, this was my first big moment with a big love scene with a big star like Lana Turner. We ever tempted to... This is one, seriously one of my favorite scenes from Spartacus. Oh, I didn't mean to be so... Why don't you kiss me? This is the first time I was ever going to have a baby. Oh, This is a scene with uh, Kim Novak. That's the picture I was talking the about. Yeah. The interesting thing about this scene is most movies nowadays, you find somebody 
zipping it down, and here I zip it up. Was that a sound or silent film? Uh... <laughs> <laughs> it's Ava Gardner in uh, Seven Days in May. Oh, yeah. Do me a favor. Um, don't don't complicate my life right now. I just got over a very bad burn. Anything you say will be wrong. Faye Dunaway in uh, in the arrangement, Dick. You don't Picture have to you. say a it's word. <laughs> but they think I'm crazy. I mean, literally nuts. And if you don't, she. Yes. One time is it? Yes. Five thirty. <laughs> Hello. Yes, Charles. Yes. Yes, thank you, Charles. You know, Dick. As I was watching these clips from movies that I've done, I suddenly realized, you know, an actor is supposed to immerse himself in the role. Mm -hmm. He's supposed to be the character that he's playing. And as I watch those clips, I have a feeling that sometimes a little bit of Kirk Douglas creeps into these scenes. I would think it'd yes. be hard to keep it out, yes. <laughs> I was going to ask how you keep in such terrific shape, but now we know. <laughs> that serious film. We'll be right back after this brief uh, message. We just saw all those, uh, all those ladies that you've worked with. Hitchcock said in an interview once that it's very hard for the romance on the screen uh, not to carry over into the private lives of the actors. Have you found this true? <laughs> and, 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 and another thing I want to ask. <laughs> now that we've answered that, <laughs> you're, you're free to reject any, any yes. question. That, now, I don't know where he said that. I think maybe it was in that Truffaut interview that he had found that it often happened. I don't see why it should. You can keep a professional well, as a matter distance. Of fact, yeah. I don't think, seriously, uh, Dick, I think very often you might have a very good relationship uh, with the person that you're working with, your leading lady, and it doesn't necessarily mean that the scenes you play will necessarily be good. In other words, it's it, it, do, it doesn't work. You know, people yeah. love to say, oh, their great romance carried over and spilled over on the screen. I don't think that's yeah. true. I think uh, it's something how, you know, you play a scene and something catches fire or it doesn't. In other words, I don't think that it necessarily follows because two people have a very close rapport that it's going to carry over into that scene. I think, if anything, it might even inhibit it because they would be aware of maybe comparing yes, it with what they're, what's going so. on on stage. Yes. Uh, you, you really have been through some, some incredible things in, in your career. I mean, the, the, the violence of the things you've been through in, uh, in, in the films. Have, have you ever been well, badly hurt? Yes, I've been hurt several times. I broke my nose in a picture, I broke a finger, and I broke a rib. You know, it's strange because when I started, when I think of, when I started my career, you're studying Shakespeare and Ibsen, mm -hmm. and then you start uh, doing movies and then suddenly you have to learn how to mount horses and juggle and skip rope and fight yeah. and and uh, suddenly all that Shakespeare training you, you wonder whatever happened to that yeah. and I actually think that in uh, uh, theater acting movie making in your field I really think that uh, vitality energy is the first requirement because if you yeah. don't have vitality and energy you can't do anything else do you do push-ups every day or a, a regimen of exercise? Uh, I do exercise every day because so many of the movies that I've done involves uh, so much exercise that, it, that has been conditioning, but I always do uh, uh, five to ten minutes of exercise. I you think do. that's all. Oh, I yeah. think that's all you need. Yeah. yeah. You know. Let, let's take a look at some of the things that you have uh, done here. This is a series of uh, action. Oh, this is a thing series of the... action things. Um, you can As a matter of fact, I think this starts with a scene I did years ago from the from the juggler when I played a clown, mm -hmm. and I actually had to learn juggling. Oh no, this is a scene from Champion. That's when I had to learn to skip oh, rope. Yeah. Fast on my feet, huh? You know, sometimes I scare myself. <laughs> <laughs> 
This was a montage. Oh, this is the scene of the juggling from a picture called The Juggler that I did years ago. To actually learn juggling for yeah. a movie is really a... Yeah, I did a clown a routine. <laughs> <laughs> I love this. I think everybody's a frustrated clown, you know, Dick? Oh, this was a scene from a picture called... Uh, Is this what you're trying uh, Man Without a Star. Yeah! Well, how about this? Pretty good aim, huh? Yeah. Holy smoke! Or would you rather do this? Seriously, how many takes did this take? When you're showing off, it only oh, takes one yes. take. Dick. When do I learn that? <laughs> you don't. That's all a lot of hogwash, kid. Look, know this. Twirling a gun never saved a man's life. There's only one thing you gotta learn. Get it out fast. And then, put it away slow. That's good advice. Get yeah. what I mean, kid? Hey! Hooper Mount. It's Please, an adult version this was of Leapfrog. A series of, uh, uh, the reverse series Hooper Mount is Leapfrog for, uh, with a twist. For a picture I did with John Wayne called the, uh, this the is War called Wagon. The did you ever hurt yourself doing like this? You. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I'd rather not hear about it if you don't. <laughs> the trick, the of course, is to Scissor make everything Mount. look easy. Oh, nice. But believe but it or it not, doesn't always the most difficult work. mount of all is the mount that never makes it. This calls for a real acrobatic skill. <laughs> you miss occasionally. <laughs> we usually don't put those on film. This is a scene uh, from Spartacus. It's a wonderful gladiator scene with Woody Strode. That looked very dangerous when you did that. Well, as a matter of fact, it, it, it really was, Dick, because we did a stupid thing. You see, those are actually made of hard metal. They're not rubber. And it, no, it's not yeah. rubber at all. That's all hard metal, and if yeah. you miss, somebody could get hurt. Yeah, and you want the take to look good, so you... Exactly. We tried it with rubber, never looked good. Yeah. 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 We have to take a message from our local stations. You probably need a rest after that. We have a, a message. We'll be right back. Stay where you are. Talking with Kirk Douglas, but that's obvious if you're watching on television. Um, if you're listening on radio, you might not know if you just tuned in. <laughs> what am I talking about? You know, I, when I have a beard, I look exactly like you. <laughs> well, approximately like you. You know, we were talking about earlier, Dick, about mistaken identity. I yeah. think the, the wildest thing that happened to me once, uh, Burt Lancaster is a friend of mine, and he did a picture years ago called Trapeze. Yeah. He's very good in it. And one day, Bert and I were having dinner in a restaurant in Palm Springs. And a man came up, had a few drinks, and he walked right past Bert, came right up to me, and started off by saying, Mr. Mitchum? <laughs> that, now, that was just the beginning. Uh -huh. And I, I never corrected him. I said, yes. He says, Mr. Mitchum, I want to tell you how wonderful I thought you were in trapeze. <laughs> I mean, this is what you call a triple mistake. He got yes, it all confused. That doesn't crush you to think that they don't have the... Oh, the no, I think that... Like that. Uh, I mean, uh, Dick, I think very often... Uh, usually when I meet people, I always say, Hello, my name's Kirk Douglas. Mm -hmm. say, well, I know who you are. But very often I think people recognize you. You know, mm -hmm. they may have seen you, but sometimes they get a little uh, bewildered. Uh, yeah. You know, they know the face is familiar. I once did... Uh, I did the reverse on someone once. I was in a town for personal appearances with a movie and it was in a big hotel and there was a big convention taking place and as I got in the elevator there were a lot of people around you know they were all a little they had a few drinks and they all had a lot of people had these badges on you know it says Joe Tyne Tulsa Oklahoma yeah and a fellow walks in with one of these badges and he's all excited hey he says Kirk Douglas and I said Joe he says how do you know me <laughs> I said aren't you Joe Tyne? He says, yeah. The sign is right there like that. I said, well, it is Joe Tyne, Tulsa, Oklahoma. Yeah, he said. I said, Joe, by this time I was almost at my floor. I said, Joe, I'm surprised you don't even remember. And I walked out of the elevator. <laughs> oh, no. To this day. 
So if Joe Tyne's listening... Now he knows, now you know. We've yeah. crushed him. Has it, does the pressure ever get too great? I, I know that your life is, you referred to it as a sort of uh, almost corny story because you really, uh, all the cliches, rags to riches, your yeah. parents came over as immigrants, you had no money, your father was a peddler, as I remember. That's right. All of that. Uh, you've said that it's almost a B-movie plot, well, the story it, of your life. Almost, it really is. You know, uh, when I, I did a tour for the State Department, uh, my wife and I, we went around uh, uh, talking to students all over the world, and you see, my life, that B story, is the, you know, it's the American story. It's the, it's the thing that's a B story here. It's an A story in any other country. It uh, happens often here, but you go outside of the United States, it doesn't happen very often. I mean, I have many friends whose parents were immigrants, who, who struggled like I did, didn't have enough to eat, and then mm -hmm. they went off to become lawyers. You know, doctors, and then a few go wrong like myself and become actors. Yeah. <laughs> but it's really a, a dream come true in a sense, w in that cliche sense. Was there ever a time when you really had the dream, I will be a famous actor someday, or did it well, just unfold? Well, you know, uh, w uh, after I graduated from St. Lawrence University, Dick, I was uh, working, I was going to the American Academy of Dramatic Arts, studying to be an actor, and I was working as a waiter in Schraff's restaurant. And I remember one night, I had my pocket full of tips, and I was walking down Central Park. I'd had a few beers, and, and we, a few of the, uh, the other waiters, who all would be actors, were walking down, and I pointed up to the Hampshire house, and I said, one of these days, I said, I'm gonna come back to this town, and I'm gonna take a suite on the 25th floor, and I'm gonna look down at this park, and it was wonderful having this dream. Yeah. And sure enough, in B-story fashion, uh, years later, I did a picture champion. I came back to New York, and I took a suite on the 25th floor, and I looked down at Central Park, and very honestly, I was, I was rather sad. And uh, I felt as if, uh, I think what happens is when a dream is fulfilled, it leaves with it a certain amount of sadness. So I think that you always have to have another dream mm -hmm. quickly to replace the dream. I don't think what that- What can uh, you do though beyond that? The 28th floor or? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. No, but seriously, you have to always strive. You have yeah, to have something that you, 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 know, you, you have to strive for, or you're robbed. I mean, uh, Tennessee Williams deals with this in a preface in one of his books. He calls it the catastrophe of success, mm -hmm. in which he explains this feeling that happened to him. Yeah. And so I think uh, a fulfillment of one dream should be replaced with another dream. Do you dream yeah. a lot, by the way? Do I dream a lot? Or do you have dreams? That, oh, yeah. 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 I have some that would curl your beard. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but television is hardly the place to talk about them. <laughs> But I, I don't remember, yeah, I have a corny one once. I don't think I ever told anybody this, but I, I once speak? was, do you want to hear it? Do you have a degree in psychiatry? Can no, you help no, me? No, no, but I'm very sympathetic and I'm a good listener and I want to hear about this. I was crossing Madison Avenue one time and I was a really out of work actor. It was, I, I can remember a, a nickel rolled off the bureau one morning and, and it went down where I could never get on the floor. This, and I, I thought, I, uh, that's how poor I am. I, I'm gonna have to walk to work. I was gonna take subway with that nickel and it done. And I was walking around that day, and I was really discouraged, just making the rounds, and I saw a silver spire on top of a building that the sun hit just right. And I thought, that's a sign that my career is going to take an upward turn, and Where did I'm you going go to come wrong? out. <laughs> I don't know. And you know nothing happened for years after that? <laughs> No, but I remember thinking that's that's like in a movie. There's that silver spire, yeah, but and uh, but, but, se but seriously, Dick. But now here I am on television talking to Kirk Douglas, and no, it's an empty experience. No, I tell you, it's just, it's like you said, but I tell you, Dick. I tell you why. I tell you why. I tell you why you failed. You see, you heard. <laughs> Look, Dick. We talk about image. Yes. You see what I mean? Now I used to come on a television show the way you are. I always wore a tie, a shirt. Yeah. You see, that's the wrong image. Now, you watch the up-and-coming people now. Never wear a tie, never sit, you know. <laughs> if you took off the tie, seriously, Dick. Oh, take, I'm... I mean, take off the tie. <laughs> Unbuttoned. Unbuttoned. Not too low. No, this is a family I'll just show. just loosen it. Now you're a hit, right? Yeah. Wait a minute, I'm getting my... I'm getting my compulsion. You've released my compulsion. I, I, I take my shirt off at the oddest time. Yeah. Now, if you were if you were really a loose oh, no, guy you like don't. you're telling me to be, you take your shirt off. Yeah,
Nicki Minaj. What, you, you, you have another dimple we don't know about? <laughs> I'm sorry, we... I'm a neighbor. <laughs> See, I, when the mood passes, I don't know what to do. You know, as it is, I'm in trouble with my wife. She, she, the last thing she said to me is, when you go on Dick Cavett's show, please, it's a very dignified, he's a very erudite fellow, yes. please be dignified, I'm in trouble already. I hope she's watching now. We have a station break, and we'll be right back. You know, yes. I, I've often wondered, this is a complete change of subject now, but do you think we get our image of how we behave from, from the movies? Very I mean, much so. uh, do people... Very much so. I think that very often in pictures that yeah. I've done, you know, I think it sometimes in relationships that I've had with girls on the screen, on the screen it, it teaches them, you know, a point of view, tenderness, an approach of consideration. I think yeah. you, you get a lot of this. In, yeah. certainly in movies that I've done. I think I was shaped my, my feelings, at least as a kid, I remember thinking, so that's how you behave with ladies. You, you know, how, you saw it on how the screen. to light two cigarettes at once. Yeah. You know, how to be gentle, kind, considerate. I could never figure out, though, as a kid in Nebraska, where those nightclubs were that I saw in the movies. <laughs> but uh, well, you never little... ran into that beautiful girl as you're walking down the street, and suddenly she said, you got a light, and she was gorgeous. It was either Lauren Bacall or Lana Turner, and you... No, not in Grand Although, Island. It was yeah, the assistant then, librarian. Who, uh, <laughs> can we, let's take a look at this, though, and, and, uh, because I think this clip isn't, this is from Champion, oh, which is... Oh, now, this is a perfect scene to show, I mean, manners, to show how a man should treat a lady. Good influence so. of film on, okay. Yes. Guess what? I'm already married. You're a liar. You think so? Well, the next time you're in Chicago, you go to 46 Eagle Street. And if you don't find Mrs. Michael Kelly there, I'll marry you any day, you say. I ain't kidding. I'm not kidding you. You've been taking me for sucker all this time. Honey, you never asked me if I was married. Anyway, what's the difference? You did all right with me. I'm gonna hock the Harris up to my ears. Where are you going? Out. I got a date with a lady. You know what a lady is? Nah, how could you? You know anything about <laughs> sculpting? You know anything about the opera? Nah, all you know is how to spend money, huh? Well, so long, Gracie. I gotta be going. I'm going with you. You're not gonna shake me now. Yes, I am. You dumped me once. Now I'm dumping you. For good. You know, in that scene, it just reminded me when I said 40, I used the address 46 Eagle Street. Well, yeah. I used to live on 46 Eagle Street in Amsterdam, New York, when I was a kid. It's a little town upstate. And I remember after this picture, uh, my mother was alive then, and my mother, whose name is Bryna, by the way, is the name of my company now, the Bryna oh. Company. Yeah. And I called my mother up, you know, and I said, gee, Ma, I just signed, signed a million dollar contract. She said, but son, are you eating enough I said, yeah, Ma, I signed a million-dollar contract. You looked awful thin in your last picture. <laughs> you know, my mother, a typical immigrant woman, I mean, mm -hmm. she couldn't, you know, that was all beyond her, her comprehension. All she was concerned about, yeah. were you eating enough? Were you putting on enough weight? What did she think when you played a nasty character like that guy? I mean, you, you have a way of being lovable and hateable at the same time. <laughs> you know, it's a, well, about? you know, I really think uh, it, it, it seriously bothered my mother. You know, when I played someone like the scene that we just saw in Champion, and I've played, you know, I've always believed virtue is not photogenic, and I think I've always been attracted to a part. Uh, I'd rather play the evil character most of the time than the, the nice fellow. And I think it really bothered my mother because she would tell people, you know, no, my son's not like that. He's really a nice boy. <laughs> <laughs> well, th there seemed to be a period, I was reading back clippings about you and all, where they liked to say that you were not a nice guy. Uh, a, a famous lady columnist, I believe, said that after well, that movie, which made you, as they say, well, that you became uh, um, less than pleasant. <laughs> well, as a matter of fact, <laughs> what she actually said 
uh, well, I won't say exactly what she said, but right after the picture, Hedda Hopper, who was quite a character, said, you know, Kirk Douglas, she said, ever since Champions come out, you've become a real SOB. She actually said it. And I said, you know, by this time, everybody had been saying all these things the minute something happens that's successful. I said, look, Hedda, you're absolutely wrong. I said, you know, I was an SOB before Champion, but you never noticed it. <laughs> but the point is, Dick, yeah. that really, I think the difficult thing is that uh, in movies, no one is equipped uh, to take any kind of success. And if when a person, after a person does his first successful picture, really he doesn't change as much as other people change. Their whole attitude changes toward him, yes. and it's a difficult readjustment. I'm sure you... Uh, you know, you find that readjustment since the time you were looking for that, that nickel. for that, for that, that nickel. Suddenly, uh, it's, it, 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 it's, a, it's a difficult process of readjusting to any form of success. I think it's very difficult. That is true. The background changes behind you, really, in a way. Exactly. And people, in a sense, change more yeah, than you do, but they're not aware of it because yeah. they look at you differently. I'd still like to have that nickel, though. <laughs> I, could, I could still use it. Here's Rose something Bud. old. Here's something new from Kimberly Clark. We'll be right back. Which movie would you flush down the John of yours? Uh, oh, that's, that's very easy. Oh. <laughs> uh, I have several that could go that route. <laughs> but I think the one that would, I would do the quickest to is a picture called Big Trees. I literally did it for nothing. I had the only time I, I ever had a contract, which was a, see, I've always been independent, it was yeah. a picture a year uh, at Warner Brothers, and I wanted to get out of that picture a year. Mm -hmm. So I said, they said, no, you can't get out. I said, I'll get out. I'll do the next picture for nothing. They said, you're kidding. I said, no, I'll do it. They don't have to pay me. So I did the picture. It was called Big Trees. I did it for nothing. It was a terrible picture, and that's the way it should end. And that's the way. How do you convince Internal Revenue that you actually did a movie and got no money for it? Did they have to give you a little note saying, no, Kirk is pay, telling the truth? They, <laughs> no, they, no, they have to pay me something. They paid yeah. me for that picture about as much as you pay me for being on this show. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Then you have no problems, I can see. I can see. <laughs> Just to satisfy the tax people. But, but you, you haven't been affected by the slump. We hear that Hollywood is a ghost town, that, the, that it's really a boarded up place, and, uh, and yet you've got three or well, four irons in the fire all the time. How have you managed to aver avoid the slump? Well, I don't think so much of it as a slump, Dick, as I think is a, it's going through, a, it definitely is going through a transition period. Uh, I think movies, there's a need for movies. Movies will become more, uh, more and more important. Uh, I think people love movies. You need them on TV as well as in theaters. In my own case, because uh, I was always independent, uh, I, because I've also loved to work in finding properties and develop them, I just, if I couldn't find financing here, I went to Europe. I had uh, Light at the Edge of the World, a picture I did with Yul Brynner of Jules Verne. That was financed in, in Spain. Catch Me a Spy, a picture coming out this fall, was financed with France and, uh, <clears throat> with France and uh, London. And then I did a, 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 a Western with Johnny Cash, a gunfight, mm -hmm. and that picture was financed by the Hickory Apache Indian tribe. I was going to ask you about that. Go I, ahead, ask me. I don't need to now. <laughs> no, I'm, seriously, I, I, I saw the movie last night, and of course one feels obligated to say I enjoyed it even if you didn't, but I did in this case, luckily, so it's easy to say. <laughs> it's, really a, it's a real yeah. good Western. Uh, and uh, right at the beginning it says the Hickory Apaches. Yes present, or something, it doesn't actually say present, but I wondered about that. What, no, what they, that? Uh, the Hickory Apache Indian tribe in Dulce, New Mexico, uh, actually financed the film. They put up over That's $2 million dollars to finance the film, and there are no Indians in it. And as a matter of fact, when they came to, uh, we had a press conference in uh, uh, Los Angeles, yeah. and when they came, we were walking into the press conference, and a reporter came up to me and said, Kirk, are those Indians in your next picture? I said, are they in the picture? They own it which, of course, yeah. they do. They, uh, they have put up the financing. Why do the Hickory Apaches have money when most Indians are, are really in terrible straits? Well, I think it depends. I think there are other tribes who have uh, uh, managed the, their finances much better and have done... I, I don't think they're the only Indian tribe that have money. I think the Hickory Apache Indian tribe have a very sophisticated uh, uh, program of investments. I hope that uh, their investment in a gunfight turns out very well because I'd hate to be a scalp <laughs> <laughs> Yes, how do you say diplomatically to a group of Apache warriors, you've taken a bath at the box office, boys? <laughs> <laughs> That's a terrible thought. 
But it, it is but really, I think, isn't it? I think with a gunfight, I think they're going to do very well. I hope so, yeah, it, because it's it's it will encourage them to invest in other pictures. If not, I don't know what will happen. Yeah. But I'd love to hear a little about that movie, uh, because it is, uh, it's a thoroughly entertaining movie. It's a, it's a good idea. Well, we, we can't do it now, however. We'll be right back, then we'll talk about it. Stay where you are. You know, um, I was surprised, I don't know why I should be surprised, that Johnny Cash was such a good actor. You always, uh, do, do you ever resent it a little bit when you've been in 55 movies and he's in one and he comes off as well as oh. an actor who's been in many, many oh, movies? Oh, no, I've never had uh, that problem. Uh, I think the better the, the other person is, uh, the, the better I can be. Yeah. As a matter of fact, in a gunfight, I picked Johnny Cash. I watched him on TV and I think he has a wonderful quality. And I never met him before. I just picked up the phone and talked to him. We had about four or five conversations on the phone. He was he, very apprehensive about doing a movie, and I sent him the script and finally went down to Nashville, Tennessee. And, uh, you know, he agreed to do the picture. And I thought, did you think he was wonderful? Yes, he's so he's I think he has good. a wonderful he's, uh, quality when you think it's about his... course, and it's yeah, perfect it's, for this It's film. about his first... Uh, first movie and I think he does a I think he does a terrific job yeah there's no sense of a guy just making it like there often is when a guy exactly. makes his first film if you, you, you forget you, about you it. have any uh, you have a clip from uh... I have a piece from gunfight yeah oh yeah I wouldn't invite you here and show a piece from a from a uh, um, uh, some Laurel and Hardy movie you would do you want do you want to see it I, I don't want to bore well, you with it if you don't want to see it <laughs> it's your show I've seen the movie yeah it, it's a this is good take a look uh, you'll see the two fellows we just mentioned and um, I'm not in it all in all, Tenor Ray, you don't seem bad located here. Making wages is all. About as much a month as I used to spend in a day. Yeah, but without getting shot at. Getting talked at near as bad. My here pays me to stand around so the cow folks would buy drinks. Then they start asking, how are things in Dodge, Kansas City, Tombstone? I bet you're really the one that can tell them, huh? You being funny? No. No, just remembering Kansas talk. They say you killed Ringo. Yeah. It's like me here and you were strung up dead by a posse in Santa Fe. Well, that ain't exactly the truth, but... Somebody sure enough killed Ringo. <laughs> Can't argue that. You know, it's it's uh, it's really strange to watch yourself in a movie. It just occurred to me. At, you know, at one time I had a real hang-up. There were like six movies yeah. that I'd already finished that I had never seen. Never seen. Really. Yeah, I've gotten to the point where I think I've seen, but I really, uh, there are very few movies uh, that I can watch myself in. I'm, I'm, I'm always dissatisfied. As a matter of fact, there's only one movie that I really love watching myself in. It's a little picture called Lonely Are the Brave. Oh, yeah. And when I watch that movie, I say, Kirk, <laughs> terrific. <laughs> <laughs> It's the only movie. I mean, otherwise, well, it's a funny feeling. Now, in this, this scene, I, I really... See, I don't think people realize what a tremendous uh, thing that is for Johnny Cash, really, in his first feature picture, uh, you know, to do such a good job. I think he's wonderful. Yeah, After I think, all, I have done a few movies. I love the way he does, does that line about that. That may be true, but somebody did kill Johnny Ringo. Is that the wonderful. It's a wonderful true. quality. It does a, Why it does do you look bigger job? on the screen? Are you as big as you'd like to be? I mean... No, I mean, you do look a little bigger. As I see you here, you, you're no shrimp uh, by, by any means. But do you know what I mean? You have a slight increase well, of size you know, on the screen. Well, uh, there's a theory that actors, you know, so-called stars, mm -hmm. should never appear as they are. Because uh, how can you ever be uh, as big as people think of you on the screen? Yeah. You know, the yeah. screen, uh, you know, you're bigger than life. When you think of the Romans that I've killed, the blood, oh my gosh, the blood. Yeah. You know, you think of all the things you do, you're, it's, you know, movies should be bigger than life. Yeah. So it's, that's why it's difficult when you, when someone, when the public is used to seeing you on the screen where one eye can be about five feet and suddenly you're, mm -hmm. it's, in, in many ways it's a letdown. I'm sorry to disappoint you, Dick. I oh, really no, wanted I wanted you to. Fine, I mean, if they don't have a bigger version of you, this will do. <laughs> What's your, what is your actual height? 5'11". 
It is 5'11". Yeah. You're, you're taller than Richard Burton, then. Well, I've never... <laughs> yeah. yeah. So... Is you're, that, is you're that ahead, good? I guess so. I'm ahead of the game? To be ahead of Burton in but anything it, is good. <laughs> we, we will be right back after this message. We're talking during the break about... I, you mentioned you broke your nose earlier, and uh, during the break I asked you how. It was by a horse broke it for you. Well, yeah. uh, I was doing a horse fall. We're yeah. talking about, you know, in, in, in Europe, with European... Uh, uh, films, very often they don't do a horse fall. It, it's dangerous for the horse. But in, I'm in sure the United they States, up over there. Yeah. Oh, it's, yeah, it's very often serious. In the United States, a horse is trained to fall. Yeah. And I was doing a picture called Indian Fighters. As a matter of fact, the first movie I did with my company, Bryna, and the first time Walter Matthau worked in the picture. And uh, I was training, I was falling a horse in the picture, and the signal uh, f to fall the horse was to pull, it varies in different horses, to pull one rein, so you pull the horse's head around and he falls. Mm -hmm. And then you get, the danger is you gotta get this leg out of the way, you see, because so when the horse falls, you get this leg out, when you fall down with it, this, yeah. you, you can't fall. But one time, I, in falling the horse, I leaned over, and when the horse's head went around, bang, Ooh. broken nose. Yeah. And did, did it push your nose into your, no, flat just, into your face, just, or just? Uh, just a little, it's still a little crooked. Yeah. I hate to keep, you know, pointing out these imperfections because you've been so <laughs> you've been so good at pointing them out for me, but I hate well, to I, add to these imperfections. But I do have a crooked nose. That's right. That's right. <laughs> but people like to know that you're human. And that you're, I see. Uh, I think that's terrific about the Hickory Apaches. I can't get over that financing yeah. the movie. I don't think they'd finance a John Wayne movie though, if they read his Playboy interview. Did you see that? He said he didn't think that it was bad that we took this country away from the Indians because. Uh, a lot of people needed land, and the Indians were being selfish and thought that they ought to have it. And uh, is that the John Wayne you know no, you made no, a movie No, with? as a matter of fact, uh, I, I don't want to get involved in a conversation on John Wayne. Oh, well, I tell you, I've made quite... You're closer to his size than I am, so get well, in here. <laughs> no, I, I've made uh, quite a few pictures uh, with John Wayne. And by the way, I've always yeah. called him John. Everybody calls him Duke. Yeah. Uh, I have never, we have never seen eye to eye on a lot of things. But professionally, yeah. I think he's one of the most professional actors I've ever worked with. Oh, yeah, he is. And uh, I've worked, I don't know, about four or five pictures with him. The last one I did was War Wagon. We worked in Harm's Way. Ca in Cast a Giant Shadow, which was a picture done in Israel, Wayne was the one who set it up. Yeah. Wayne is the one who called me in London. and said, hey, Kirk, I think there's a part you ought to play. So we have never, <laughs> whenever we work in a picture, we rarely, maybe we'll have dinner together one night during the whole picture. But we get along very well. We never discuss politics. Stay off politics, that's right. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> but he's the that's... first guy on the set. He's mm -hmm. the hardest worker I've ever worked with. Yeah. And I think he's quite a character. As a matter of fact, I just saw a picture of his Big Jake, which will be coming out soon. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, it's, it's a really good John Wayne picture. He really is a giant personality yes, on the is. screen. Yes, so, he is. So. I mean... Has he been hurt by a horse? Would a horse dare hurt him? Oh, I uh, think he'd hurt a horse, <laughs> probably. <laughs> they really can't get a horse big enough for him, can they? How, how big is John Wayne? I'm interested in dimensions. Uh, I'd say John's about six foot four. He is that tall. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, sure. No wonder you don't see eye to eye. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there I am, harping That's on good. your size again. Uh, you made a Jules Verne film that I'd heard about for some time, and I don't, I don't mean 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, that's oh, no, back. Right at the, the edge of the world. Yeah, is that a fact? That's coming out. It's coming out. It, it opened in Washington. It's coming out soon in this yeah. area. And in the, as a matter of fact, the reason I did it was because of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. I always wanted to do another Jules Verne picture. There's a lot of good stuff in Jules Verne to do. Yeah. You, I asked if they, if they could get a little clip from that. Do we have, we have a little bit of Yeah, I think the they Jules put Verne's together some things from a trailer. I haven't seen huh. it, but I'll be glad to... Uh, Okay. I'd be glad to, uh, you know, explain it. Okay. This was all shot in uh, Spain. The, it's a very simple story in that the light represents goodness. I play a good man in this, and Ewell Brenner plays the evil man. And when the light is out, you have the results of evil, which is the, uh, uh, the wreckers come in and wreck the uh, ships. Uh, this is beautiful country. It's all in uh, a place near where Salvador Dali lives in uh, Cadiz, Spain. This is a French actor, Jean-Louis Drouel. Of course, that's Samantha Egger. Samantha Egger, yes. And there he is, the evil one himself. But don't worry, I don't want anybody to be frightened because 
at the end, everything works out all right. <laughs> but I wanted to do a picture, Dick, that's uh, sheer entertainment. That's in very simple terms. It doesn't try to make uh, anything more profound than that good uh, takes care of uh, takes care of evil. Yeah. What? You can see what happens. <clears throat> Wait a minute. We saw a horse with a horn, and then you running. Uh... The... I was being pursued. That was a scene. Uh, Ewell plays this game yeah. where he has this sharp, uh, like a unicorn on the horse, where he mm -hmm. tries to run me down. That uh, Light at the Edge of the World, again, is an example of the different ways of making movies. We've talked about the uh, Indian tribe financing one. This was financed by a, 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 Spanish, a Spanish bank. Uh, and we shot this, this was all shot in, uh, in Spain. Frankly, I get a little tired of, uh, of going to, uh, you know, far off places to make movies, you know, and get away from my family. I prefer to be making more movies here. Yeah, but you gotta go where the, where the scenery is. Exactly. We have a message, we'll be right back. Talking with Kirk Douglas, we haven't been terribly personal tonight. Do you ever get really depressed, down, gloomy? Sure. Sure, I think... I want to go outside. I mean, isn't that a, uh, uh, you know, a, a human process? I think everybody, uh, you go through different uh, periods of your life where you sort of uh, take self-inventory yeah. and you wonder, what am I doing? Am I doing what I want to do? I think the person, uh, really, happiness in life really is doing the work that you want to do. And I think uh, for someone to be working at what he wants to do is very fortunate. So in that way, I think that I'm more aware now how lucky I am than I used to be. I, I think a lot of things that I used to take for granted, I appreciate now. Because I think it's, I'm lucky to have been able to do the thing that I want to do in life, and that uh -huh. is to, to make movies. Yeah. I, think it's a, I think it's a great contribution, because I think the greatest contribution of movie making is not the statement that a movie might make. It's fine for a movie to have a statement, but I don't think there's anything, Dick, more important than the fact that if you make a movie and for an hour and a half or two hours, millions of people all over the world are taken out of their, their problems. The reason a person goes to a movie is to forget the problems of their life. So if you permit them to forget their problems yeah. and get involved in what you're doing on the screen, I think that's the most important contribution. And I think that sometimes there's a tendency to be pretentious with movies and become too concerned with making a statement. I've yeah. been guilty of the same thing myself. That's why in Light at the Edge of the World, I wanted to make sheer entertainment. If it could entertain someone for two hours, I think that's great. So you don't have any doubts about your life being misspent. Some actors say I, I, I'm a, a man in the acting profession always wonders if it's, a, if it's a really manly profession. Should he be out engineering? Well, it isn't a manly profession. It's, yeah. a, it's a childish profession. Uh, you couldn't be a complete grown-up adult and be an actor. Uh, you have to have a childish part of you. I mean, after all, if I were a sophisticated adult, how could I say, here I am fighting evil represented by Yul Brynner? You have to have a yeah. childish part of you. It's true. We're making a guy you know, take watched, his shirt off. As my kids have grown up, I've watched them, you know. Mm -hmm. Children are, are natural actors. They pretend they're cops and robbers. And I think all actors retain a, a certain amount of that within themselves. Yeah. They have to or they couldn't function as actors. And I think that's why they become self-denigrating, they think, well, it's not enough. Yeah. I, I get the feeling that you ha are capable of a terrific bad temper. <laughs> oh, I, I see, I was you right. saying. <laughs> no, I do, I have that. And, and uh, it's probably one of I the many things. I don't see that in you. It's probably one of the many things <clears throat> that we have in common. Uh, well, I don't know that I, 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 <laughs> I wonder if, uh, if you're snappish, can you get? Yes, I think as a matter of fact, that's been a, a healthy thing for me. Yeah. Uh, I don't think it's uh, given me a, a very pleasant reputation often, but I think it's been a good escape valve. I think very often I'm too quick yeah. to express myself in anger or whatever it might be. It's healthy for me because it mm -hmm. lets the steam out, but very often if people don't understand it, you know, it, uh, yeah. it doesn't do you feel create a very favorable impression. After you blow up at somebody, that, do you feel sad? After Terrible. You, you, yeah, Terrible. I do too. I, bother about, oh, what yeah. does he think? Why did I say this? What a bully I was. Yeah. I shouldn't have said that. It's, it's, it's awful. <laughs> yeah, I, I have that too. It's, 
Uh, what, um, we have see, a what lot else in we can... common, Dick. I, let's I, see, do you, how much sleep do you need? How much sleep do I need? Yeah. Five, six hours. Uh, we have nothing in common. No, no, I, <laughs> I can sleep literally round the clock. And, oh, really? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's one. No. Uh, no, 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 I don't need. Time. If I have five, six, seven hours, would be a... You read a newspaper every day? Oh, yes. Do you? Yes, don't you? Yeah. I mean, don't yeah. you think actors are also concerned with what's going on in the world? Perhaps sometimes a little bit too concerned. Some are, but I don't think they have to be. I mean, I don't think everybody has to be. I don't see why they should apologize if they don't, for example. I mean, some actors don't need to... They should just act or do what they want to do. No, but you mean they don't read the paper. I mean, you're so, still a part of the world you live in. You don't divorce yourself from the world you live in. You're interested yeah. uh, in knowing what's going on around you. I think uh, everybody owes it themselves to be aware of the world they live in, to be a part of it. Yeah. No? I think it's good if they do. Again, but I, we don't I, have anything I, in common. I don't insist on it. I mean, I think a man could just write poetry if he wanted to, and I, I wouldn't care if he ever read a paper or not. Oh, I'm not concerned by that. I just think yeah. that they would be uh, missing something by not being concerned with what's happening oh, in sure. the world. To just cut yourself off from the yeah. world would be, uh, you know, depriving yourself of your environment, so to speak. I can see why a, an artist like Ingmar Bergman, for example, would say he just cuts himself off from all life the whole time he's making a film mm -hmm. because he just wants that tunnel vision on his work. Well, he may do that, sure. I can understand why you're making a film. You mm -hmm. tend to block out the rest of the uh, the rest yeah. of the uh, the world i understand that yeah. i think that happens to all of us i think i too i think all actors tend to focus just on what they're doing but that's just for a temporary period of time what's then you have to go back into the world you're living no yeah what's the closest you ever were to death <laughs> <clears throat> well as a matter a of fact i tell you it. i tell you very honestly it was in this picture, A Light at the Edge of the World. I'll tell you a very uh, true story. Uh, we're shooting this picture. It has very sharp, jagged rocks all around. And in yeah. one scene, I did a stunt myself, and I thought I was being very careful. And I asked my stuntman to... Uh, I was up on top of a roof, and I had to jump down. So I put a uh, platform below the roof, because the rocks were on the other side, and I put the stuntman there just to double check to, to brace me. Uh -huh. I, it was in a rehearsal. I jumped off the roof onto the platform and went to him for support. He fell off. We both went right off the platform into the rocks. And I think, to me, I was very fortunate because yeah. the, the rocks there, if just have hit one jagged rock, it was about a 15, 18 foot fall, you could easily split your head open. And I think that accidents, you know, there have been, when accidents happen in, in pictures very often, it's, it's usually a silly thing. It's something that you never anticipated. And uh, I try to anticipate. People very often say, I got a nose for danger. People very often say, Kirk, how does this smell? Because uh, I think uh, I'm not a, I don't do things stupidly. I've done lots of my own stunts, but I try to work everything out carefully. But that one in the scene with Woody Strode, I wouldn't have done that if I wasn't confident in Woody. I knew that we could both work together. Spartacus. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Message. We'll be right back. Would you let me make an experiment? Don't, don't, don't give away any clues here. How many know what movie he won the Oscar for? Anyone? Who knows? What? 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 Spartacus. Who else? Who else has a guess? The champion. The champion. Who else? That's right. Never That's right. won. It's interesting. People don't know. I mean, it doesn't matter. Or maybe it does. Does well, it matter to no, you? Well, no, I think a lot of people do know. I know. You know. <laughs> but, I, I mean, uh, it's funny. You just assume that a number of people no. have, and you start to see the list of people who haven't won an Oscar. It's astounding. Yeah. No, I've they get They give those honorary ones to make up for it after a while. But yeah. No, I've been nominated make three difference? times. But yeah, you're yes, up all makes, the time. It makes a big, big difference. I think every actor would really like to win an Oscar. I won a, a New York Film Critics Award for Lust for Life when they had newspapers. Yeah. Uh, but I think... <laughs> I think you'd like to win. An Oscar has uh, great significance because it's voted on, mm -hmm. you know, by the people uh, of your own industry. Yeah. And, uh, and yet George and, Scott has made it respectable to turn one down now. Or... Well, I, uh, I thought George was very wrong. Uh, I voted for him because I thought he gave the best performance. Yeah. But I thought George was wrong. And as a matter of fact, I put George in one, almost one of his first pictures, List of Adrian Messenger. Oh, yes. I thought he was wrong because... If you do a picture 
like Patton, which is done by a big studio, it's done with big money, you have an agent comes in and negotiates the biggest deal you can make for yourself, then as a result of that, if you're nominated, then to turn against the system, I think, is wrong. Mm -hmm. But I'm glad that in spite of that, that George won the Oscar, because I think he deserved it. Yeah, even though he didn't want it. Yeah. yeah. It, 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 I want it. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you can get his. Uh, we have less than a minute in this segment left. Uh, who got a part you wanted at some point? Well, as a matter of fact, I tell you this: uh, there are two people who got. I'm not so smart. This again. Why, after all, this whole program was to show my imperfections. I'll give you a few more. <laughs> okay. Uh, you see, Dick, I'm not so smart because I turned down two parts. Both of them won Oscars. What were they? Stalag, 17. Bill Holden won an Oscar. Yeah. Cat Ballou, Lee Marvin won an Oscar. I turned them both down. So you can add that to my imperfections. <laughs> That's pretty good. And Rise and Fall of the Roman Empire, you turned down and it, won, it, made, a, it made a million and a half dollars or something like that? No, they offered me. Oh, they offered you that? That much. And that's, another one, that my, that's another one of my boo-boos. Oh, you're, oh. Really, you're really heaping it on. You know how to hurt a fellow. Oh, the man is full of warts. We have a brief <laughs> message. Kirk Douglas. In spite of your imperfections, you're a shining example. And it's really been a pleasure to meet you. You've really been a... Thank you, Dick. Yeah. I've really enjoyed being on the fun. show. It's been fun. Thank you. Thank you. We'll see you tomorrow night. I've never had any hesitancy about playing so-called unsympathetic roles. I've always been anxious, interested in playing what I considered a, an exciting, dramatic role. I suppose I played one of the first anti-heroes in the picture Champion. After all, he raped his ex-wife, he punched his crippled brother, so he wasn't exactly a sympathetic character. But in Champion, for example, it intrigued me because it was a wonderful movie about the American system of success. And Ace in the Hole, of course, was a, a wonderful opportunity to work with a giant like Billy Wilder and play, again, uh, almost a similar theme. You see, the desire in America to get ahead, to get on top. And here we use something that was based on a true story. It was a Floyd Collins case, you know, a ruthless... Uh, reporter. So, no, the fact that he was uh, an unscrupulous fellow, I think he had some redeeming qualities. See, if I play a weak character, I always try to find out where is he strong. If I play a strong character, I try to find out where is he weak. You know, chiaroscuro, light and shade. Uh, it's uh, very important. So to me, it was a, a, a very exciting role to play and I thought one of uh, Billy's best movies, even though it wasn't as successful in the United States as it was in foreign countries. It was an interesting movie. Yes, Billy, you know, Billy's a giant. You know, when I think of, uh, I mean, I've been fortunate. I've worked with Joe Mankiewicz and Howard Hawks and Ilya Kazan and, uh, you know, and so many, uh, Willie Wyler, you know, real big directors. Billy is one of the giants uh, that will that will always be there. Uh, <clears throat> yes, he. Uh, I like to think that I can contribute to a script, and very often working with a director, I do contribute, uh, and they are glad to take some of my suggestions. Or I like to think that I can come up with some interesting pieces of business, <clears throat> but it's hard to come up with something uh, with Billy that he can't top. I mean, I remember uh, one piece of business where he had me sitting on the uh, desk. I put a cigarette in my mouth, I took a match, and I just pressed the key of the, of the typewriter and let the, whoosh, the typewriter sh shoot by, light the match. I mean, See, just conceiving a piece of business like that was so eloquent to tell you about the kind of a character that I was. He, you know, he was brilliant with little, little touches. And uh, Billy worked in a way that so few people work today and are able to work. I know when we were shooting Ace in the Hole, 
We start shooting it, I think he only had about two acts of the script. I'm sure in his mind, he had, uh, you know, everything else more or less laid out the way he wanted to do. But he had that, it was almost audacious. But it was always exciting. You always, uh, you know, were kept on your toes. Uh, because, you know, Billy was so stimulating because he has a terrific sense of humor, very often very biting. But it was a challenge. I, I, I'm uh, sorry that I only did uh, one picture with him. He did want me. I made a terrible mistake in my life. He asked me to play uh, in Stalag 17, which I turned down because I'd seen the play and wasn't so impressed with it. My stupidity was not to realize what a talent like Billy Wilder would do with it. Matter of fact, Bill Holden played the part and won an Oscar. But uh, I've always, you know, maintained my friendship with Billy throughout the years. Very often I've run into him. He'd be shooting something in Europe and I'd be shooting a movie. We've always made a, a, a joke about, uh, I'd always ask him about improving the third act of whatever I was doing. And as a matter of fact, he'd always come up with ideas that I thought were much better than the script that I had for improving the third act, but it was a problem to try to sell someone. Usually it would be an audacious idea, but uh, Billy is a giant. Uh, I think Billy is an arrogant director, uh, but I say that with uh, affection. His arrogance is well-deserved. I mean, uh, he knows that he's good. Uh, and as I say, you know, it would be a game. I'd always try to think of something, you know, that might be a real big plus, and usually he would always top it. <clears throat> so that was a, a, a challenging, a challenging thing. He had a great sense of humor, so he had a wonderful way of, uh, you know, of, of keeping you relaxed, which is so important, you know, to keep you in... in, in see, an actor is such a pathetic thing. Because like now, he's, I'm sitting here in front of a camera. I risk making a fool of myself. And every time you make a movie, you risk making a fool of yourself. You can't hide behind a book that you wrote or a painting that you painted. You are the character. So uh, I think Billy, with all of his biting wit, has that understanding about actors. And I think... Uh, even though he would not be quick to admit it, he does have an appreciation and an affection for actors. Very often you work with a very talented director who really doesn't, they don't like actors. You know, they're just necessary uh, tools to bring across what they're trying to do. The variety, I mean, Billy is capable, he's so brilliant in comedy, and he's so brilliant in hard-hitting things. Uh, Ace in the Hole, the picture that I did, was a very hard-hitting film, so unlike uh, Some Like It Hot, which was such a brilliant comedy. So Billy had a wide range. Uh, frankly, in the last few years, I would have liked, and I once mentioned it to him, I would like to have seen him do another hard-hitting picture because I think his humor is so hep, it's so in now. It's that biting, sardonic, uh, you know, humor uh, that he has. And uh, I, I think it would, it, it, it's modern. It's not old-fashioned, just like almost any movie of Billy Wilder's, you know, passes the test of time. They're not old movies. They, there's something that would be difficult to compete against now by other filmmakers. In many countries, it's big hit. It was not a big hit here. And I remember at the time being shocked by that. And I think that the it revealed something to me that very often people in the media uh, who are in a position where they are making comments and criticisms of uh, other people and other things are quite sensitive about being criticized herself. And here I was portraying a ruthless, unscrupulous reporter who kept someone, and it's based on a true story, remember, who actually kept someone down there in that hole in order to generate 
a more dramatic story. And I think that that movie is as uh, uh, significant, more significant now, because when we made the movie, it was before television. And you see now so, many, so much, so often, especially in television, where they're almost becoming into show business. They want to do something that's visual, dramatic, and sometimes in doing that, they stretch the, uh, the, the uh, objective reporting that they're supposed to accomplish. You know, you don't really know yourself and you're confronted with a certain situation. If you were close to a million dollars and it looked as if no one would know, it's not yours, but no one would know if you took it, would you take it? You know, it's really hard to know until you have that situation. Uh, here, the reporter that I played, he was a tough guy. He wasn't such a bad guy, but he couldn't resist the opportunity to get back into the big time. And he never meant to kill this fellow who was down in the hole. If you remember, uh, before the picture was over, he desperately tried to save the fellow. Of course, by that time, it probably was not only too late for the fellow in the hole, uh, but it was too late for the audience to even generate enough sympathy for the character that I played. You know, he had, he had, done, he had done too much. But th those sort of dangerous roles have always been roles that, uh, you know, excite me. I have never hesitated to play a role because I say, oh, he's too... Uh, you know, unlikable. Uh, it reminds me of the situation that happened with John Wayne and me years ago when I did a picture called Lust for Life based on the life of Van Gogh. And after the, uh, we had had a, a private screening of it and Wayne was there and we had a little, afterwards, a few drinks. He had a few drinks and he kept looking at me and wanted me to go out on the veranda and have a talk and he was furious with me. He says, how could you play a weak character like that? And I said, well, John, I'm, I'm, I'm an actor. I'm not Van Gogh. I'm trying to portray. I thought it was a challenge. No, he says, we've got to play macho. You know, it kind of interested me because when you think of it, Wayne has always tried, usually has played a certain role that he's identified himself with. I have tried to play a variety of roles, but in spite of that, the audience sort of pigeonholes you. Uh, you see that in the uh, imitations that people do of you, you know, what you're like and so on. And they do capture a quality that you have. But I have always felt that an actor has got to know much more clearly than other people what is the world of make-believe and what is the world of reality? Uh, you know, you don't get lost in the role that you're playing. The audience gets lost. If you get lost, you wouldn't know uh, how to hit your marks, where to be. You, you've got to be aware there's a camera there. You know what I mean? Suddenly, I can't be going this way. He'll say, I want to I want to see you. So you really, when you're acting, I don't mean to go into a dissertation on acting, but you have to be aware uh, of what you're doing. For Ace in the Hole, I went down to, at that time, the Herald Examiner. And I said, look, I'd like to work as a reporter. And for about a week, I was there working. And then one of the questions I asked the reporter that I was working with, I said, look, how do you get a byline in the newspaper? Well, and he was explaining to me it takes years of working and so on. So after a few days, they sent me out on a story with a photographer. Something happened with two kids or something. And we took pictures. And I wrote up a story, and the next day, there was the story with the pictures and the byline by Kirk Douglas. And the fella said to me, he looked at me, he said, you know, I take it back. The best way to get a story with a byline is first you become a movie star. <laughs> <laughs> but I've always tried to, uh, you know, you might call that method acting. Uh, I, I try to get the feeling, you see, working around the... Uh, a newspaper gave me a feeling of what a newspaper's like. I've always tried to do things like that. If I'm doing a Western, I work around with cowboys, and you work with horses, you do riding. You get a, you get a feeling of what it's like. 
it's like a pendulum that swings. It, it got to be very fashionable. The director was the one. It was his film. I've always thought, why isn't it the film of the man who wrote it? That's why in the case of Billy Wilder, I say, well, in his case, he wrote the script, and then he directed it. But very often, uh, you know, what, what is a director doing but interpreting a script? Uh, what is the actor doing but interpreting the script? So in a sense, uh, I think one of the most important elements in a film that's usually uh, neglected is the writer. Now, very often, there are certain directors who work very well with a writer in developing the script. But I think the so-called auteur thing ha has been abused, except in cases of people like Billy Wilder, who writes the script, and then he directs it. Then he has the right to say it's a Billy Wilder film. My first guest has been in over 75 films. Uh, he's also a best-selling author. This book is on the New York Times best-selling list. Uh, let's bring him out. Legend, Kirk Douglas. probably think this is a review of my oh, new book. Oh, no, no. I thought you had, like, some from the racetrack or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, now, look, how come in this picture, look at how beautifully dressed you are. Now, look at this. Look at this. <laughs> <laughs> I lost that suit. <laughs> By the way, I see you. Together. You I'm have sorry. a new hairdo. Uh, yeah, since you were here, it's a little new. Yeah. You yeah. know... By the way, that is very similar to the hairstyle that I had in Spartacus. Yeah. Really? I had a, yeah, when well, I did Spartacus, oh, right, yeah. I had a, Yeah, look at I the monitor. Look at your monitor. Oh, yeah, look, look, look. Is that similar to that? I'm ripping you off. <laughs> <laughs> Fashion just evolved. But I tell you, but I tell you a problem that you have. Mm -hmm. I, I, I have drove... a lot of them, but this is one. <laughs> this is one of them. No, I drove down Sunset uh, Boulevard, and I saw this big billboard. And you have a different hairstyle in the in the billboard there. You have to change that billboard. Yeah, you're right. You're right. As a matter of fact, we got to get rid of some of these covers and billboards before I start to make people not just. Oh, 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 oh. But anyway, you uh, know, I also saw. I have a billboard <laughs> on the strip with my new book. I never, I never, I never was on a billboard before. I like it. You, I, you have a nice feeling when you go by. You see, there you are, sort of lying out there, sort of. Yeah, except one day there was like a bird right above my head. And, and I was like, oh, critics everywhere, you know. But, but there was a bird right about to take care of business. Um, this book is really taking care of business. Uh, New York Times top ten, is it? Best selling list? Dance with the Devil. What is it about? Well, you know, uh, writing a novel is something I never thought I'd do. Mm -hmm. You know, after I wrote my autobiography, and yeah. it did pretty well, you know, people thought, well, I guess now he just sat down and wrote a, a, a novel. But I started writing Dance with the Devil while I was making movies about uh, eight or ten years ago. And I seen you, what fascinated me was I was always intrigued with what people will do in order to survive. And in Dance with the Devil, I have, I tell the story of a man who lives a lie all of his life. He pretends to be something that he's not. And this is a charade that puts a terrible burden on him. Then I have a girl who's a, ref a beautiful refugee from Poland who becomes a prostitute in order to survive. And the relationship between these two is what my story is all about. How do you like it so far? Sounds good. <laughs> Sounds good. But it, it's doing very well. What makes a good writer? Do you know? Well, you know, I, I really, uh, I never thought of myself, Arsenio, as a writer. I've worked with a lot of important uh, screenwriters, but I think that writing a novel really is an extension of being an actor. Because what I like is that 
uh, it's not a lonely thing at all. I thought, you know, you write all alone in a room because you're always with the characters in the book. And it's kind of an ego trip because as an actor, I play the men, the women, the children, and I decide who sleeps with whom. There was one guy in the book who bugged me. I had him murdered. So you have a lot of control. <laughs> it's fun. I've enjoyed it. I'm already writing my, my second novel, and it's something that really excites me. I enjoy it. By the way, I, had a, I got a big thrill out of meeting Isaiah Thomas. Yeah. Where, did my, where did I tell my son Michael? Because, you know, he's a big basketball fan, and we yeah. watch most of the games on TV together. So he'll be uh, pretty proud. Oh, Isaiah said something funny to me. He said, uh, well, what does Michael call you? I said, what do you mean? He calls me Dad. Oh, he said, he does? What? I said, what do you think he calls well, He said, gee, I think of you were Michael Douglas. Uh, you're, you're Kirk Douglas. He's Michael Douglas. I said, yeah, but I'm his dad. Yeah, yeah, that, that is a strange area. Are, yeah. are you a basketball fan? Yeah, I love it. I love it. Oh, yeah. That guy, I watch it all. Yeah, I mean, it was, it's a, you know, I think in our profession, Arsenio, and you've dealt with so many people, and I think I see when I watch you, uh, and your show, you always have that enthusiasm. It's exciting to see people who are champions in their field. Yeah. And he's a real champion. He is. He's a champion on and off the court. Yeah. Uh, we'll be right back with more Kurt Douglas. You have a character in the book called Danny Dennis. That's right. And you talked about how he has a problem liking himself, accepting himself. What does Kirk Douglas like about himself? Well, you know, my theory, Arsenio, is I think every person, man or woman, they have to take inventory. They have to kind of look back where they came from. You can't forget that. You have to know where you are and where you're going. And I think then you take... Uh, uh, you, 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 you take an evaluation of who you are. You see the good things about yourself, you see the bad things about yourself. If I were saying, to answer your question, what do I like about myself, I, th I would have to say I like the relationship that I have with my four sons. Mm -hmm. I've worked on that all my life, and it's nice for me to see four sons all in this business. And I've seen you, I try to keep them out of the business, but they're all in it. And now they're grown up, and I like the fact that I'm able to have a good relationship with Michael, Joel, Peter, and Eric. That pleases me. It sure pleases them, too. Uh, you were going to say something? Uh, um, what is that, by the way? Oh, this? Well, you know, that's funny. My wife is a French. We met in Paris. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was awarded the Officier de Légion d'Honneur. And that's what this is. Now, my son, Peter, he always gets annoyed when I wear this because I did get the Medal of Freedom, which is a much more important uh, honor in our own country. So he says, why do you wear this? I said, well, your mother likes to wear this one because it's like a little rose, you see? So that's why she puts that on. As a matter of fact, it would go good with this. I may send you one. Yeah, I'd love to have one because I'll probably never get one any other way. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope you send me one of yours. All right. Um, you mentioned your wife. I, I read uh, in an interview that you said you liked women. I think it was in your first book, too. Um, you liked women with overbite. That's right. And I want to tell you. <laughs> yeah, you know, I look back and I found that uh, so many women in my life, including my wife, always had an overbite. And I find that very sexy. Any women out there with an overbite? <laughs> yeah, oh. <laughs> I think that uh, I always found that very attractive. I don't know why. Hmm. How do you feel about overbite? Well, I I've never had a woman with no overbite. It sounds painful, but... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I I I'm young and I'm willing to learn. So, you know, let's talk. <laughs> oh, my. Uh... <laughs> 
You and your son. <laughs> We've been talking a lot about your son. You and your, uh, Michael are doing a movie together? Yeah, Michael and I talked for quite some time about doing a movie. As a matter of fact, he's a little annoyed because I'm writing my second novel now. Uh, and I'm enjoying it. It's a new thing for me. You know, after all, I've done almost 80 movies. And I think, well, maybe, maybe people have seen enough of me in movies. But Michael and I have always talked. Wait, wait, wait. We got, they, they got a vote up here. They say no. <laughs> no, but Michael and I have talked about doing a movie together. Mm -hmm. And we're pretty close to one right now. So maybe in the fall, we'll start really working on it. Yeah. Because Michael's getting a little noise. It looks bad. Put the pen down and get in front of the camera. But I'd enjoy that. I'd like to do... It would be fun to do a movie with Michael, and it would be a fun to do a movie with my youngest son, Eric. He's in Israel now, doing a movie. But I'd like that. Yeah. I, that, would, that, would, that would turn me on. I'd like that. See, this thing is going so good, the writing. Uh, but I agree with them. I'd love to see you on the screen. Well, suppose it didn't go good. Uh, we all get good and bad reviews. What would you do if you got a bad review? Well, you know, uh, I've been in this business for about 40 years, mm -hmm. and you never get used to getting a bad review. You don't like it. It hurts. And I know you read my autobiography, and you know how important it was to me to get a pat on the back. Yeah. I wanted a pat on the back of my father, and I never get it, got it. And I think all actors feel that way. You learn to cover it up, you know, like your little kid, somebody hits you, you say, ha ha, didn't hurt. It hurts, mm -hmm. but you pretend that it doesn't. So uh, it's one of the things that you have to face. Uh, writing a, a novel, our senior, is much tougher than a movie, because in a movie you can say, well, what could I do with Burt Lancaster? He was hanging around, I mean, you know, you can blame Burt, you can blame the cameraman, you can blame your leading lady. Mm -hmm. But when you write a book, you have no one else to blame. You know, it's yeah. not a collaborative effort. But that's the challenge of it, and I find that exciting. But you don't like a bad review. So you it mean that's you. what I have to look for? I, when I am a veteran like yourself, I will still look at a bad review and say, <laughs> <laughs> it still will bother me? I won't get a thick skin? I think so. No, no. You, you especially, because you're very sensitive. You're, you're really a professional. And if you are, you're, you, have, you don't lose that sensitivity. If you get thick skin, you lose the sensitivity that makes you a good performer. So you'll always be uh, sensitive to a bad review. But you're not going to get many bad reviews. And oh. I'm always going to give you a good review. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, that's kind of all I need. Kirk Douglas. <laughs> His book is called Dance with the Devil. If you'd like to read, check this one out. We'll be right back. milestone day for one of Hollywood's most enduring stars. Kirk Douglas is 100 years old today and he sat down for a rare interview with our entertainment guru George Pinocchio. Okay thank you. Kirk Douglas is a show business legend but he'd probably wince at that word because he considers himself to be just a regular guy. Well today nothing regular about this. He is celebrating his 100th birthday. Kirk invited me into his home recently to talk about his long life, his career, and the joy of giving. I don't think you should strive to be a hundred. I think you should try to do something worthwhile in life, help people. Kirk Douglas and his wife Anne have been helping people for several decades. The longtime movie star grew up very poor, but Hollywood made him very rich. I made a lot of money being an SOB on camera. And over the years, Kirk and Ann have donated a lot of that money, more than $100 million, to causes close to their hearts, the homeless, Alzheimer's, and refurbishing more than 400 playgrounds in the Los Angeles Unified School District. When you have been born poor, you have sympathy to help other people. So I have given all my money away. I want to go out of this world the way I came in with nothing. 
100 Years of Life has given Kirk a lot. A successful movie career, three Oscar nominations, and an honorary Oscar, and a signature role. What's your name, slave? Spartacus. But the name of Kirk's personal favorite film of his, the 1962 Western, Lonely Are the Brave. All right, whiskey girl. Just another 50, 75 yards, and we got pine trees rolling all the way to Mexico. I love that picture. So many pictures. Does it ever make him want to act again? Everything made me want to act again. But now I look at lying in my bed, and I see all my scripts across the room. Nine a movie. That's enough. Kirk has invited me back to his house when he turns 105. At 100, he's still got it. I'm talking about who you. The, who is that man? <laughs> I, 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 I don't know. He's asking me questions about you. What's up for him? <laughs> Kirk and Ann remain very active. Together, they've written a new book called Kirk and Ann, Letters of Love, Laughter, and a Lifetime in Hollywood. It's Kirk's 12th book, and it's due out in May. And today, the family celebrated with an afternoon tea at a local hotel. Oh, what a great, a great honor. <laughs> and despite his stroke, very sharp, with, with a sense of humor and everything. It's just fantastic he to see. He is completely intact, funny as ever, and still giving away money they have. <laughs> oh, wonderful, great story. Thank Thanks. you, George. Okay, so got we got it, yeah. Um, first of all, thank you so much for doing this. I've told Marsha how excited I am, but it's a, it's a great honor for me to do this. And, uh, from New York. Yeah. <laughs> you just have to speak out. Sure. So if my old ears will hear you. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so we'll, I, I'll ask you specifically about the book in a bit, but I hope we can. I want to make this about the whole oh, story. So to begin with, uh, can you talk about where where were you born and raised, and what sort of a childhood did you oh have? Oh my God! <laughs> Just the small stuff, right? I was born in a small town, upstate New York. Amsterdam, mm -hmm. and of course you can read all that in my first book, mm -hmm. Right My Son. We were seven kids. I had six sisters, and I was the only boy. And we had a, we were very poor, uh, and we lived by the mill and railroad tracks. And that's when I was a young boy, that's them hobos after uh, from the train we come at night and knock on the door. And I was scared of the hell because they all were disheveled. And the hobo would ask for food. Mm -hmm. My mother was never afraid. And even though we had not much food, she always found something for them. And she said to me something she was, that I have never forgotten. She said, even a beggar must give to another beggar who needs it more. And I have always remembered that phrase and it has encouraged me to help other people. Like we, we did 400 playgrounds mm -hmm. for the schools. I have a Ozerman unit, Harry's Haven, because I have, well, I have a lot of things. Right. Um. One thing that I read in, in preparing for this was that you encountered a lot of anti-Semitism as a kid and that, uh, and, and that that was difficult. It was, not, it was not fun in your community. Well, all of the immigrants, they're, 
it's always someone against the Italian or the Poles, and always someone against the Jews. Mm -hmm. So the anti-Semitism was a part of my life, all through my life. And it's something that every Jew deals with. And in spite of that, I think the Jewish race has conducted itself pretty well and made their contribution to our life. Is it true that some members of your community were impressed by your, I may, maybe your Hebrew school studies or something, to the point where they wanted you to, to send you off to become a rabbi? Oh, God, that was <laughs> awful. <laughs> They wanted me to be a rabbi, <laughs> and I couldn't tell them that I wanted to be an actor. Ever since when I was a kid in second grade, I, I, did, I did a play. My wife, my mother made me a black apron, and I, I played the shoemaker in the second grade. And my father, who never interested himself in what I was doing, was in the back, and I didn't know her. And after the performance, he gave me my first Oscar, and that it was an ice cream cone. <laughs> I've never forgotten that. <laughs> so, at what point did you first know that you wanted to be an actor for the long run? Was there a moment that you can remember? I mean, obviously you said you tried it, but when did you know that's what you wanted to be? I knew it when I did that play, mm -hmm. and they applauded, <laughs> and I liked that sound. Right. <laughs> and have been searching for that sound ever since. <laughs> and sometimes I get it, and sometimes I don't. Right. <laughs> um... Around the, well, from from your small, from your town where you grew up in, you decided, I believe, that you needed to get out. And so how did you go about doing that when it came time for college and beyond? What was, how did you, yeah, how did you leave? Repeat the question. Sure. When, at some point, I, I gather that you decided you needed out of Amsterdam. You wanted to go beyond there. How did you go about going off to school and getting into school and studying acting eventually? Well, when I graduated high school, I didn't know what to do. I didn't have any money. And a friend of mine, Big Ricky, he went off to college. So when he came back the first year, he said what well, to me, come on, why don't you go with me? It was not his second year. So I said, what's the one now? I had $163 in my pocket. And we hitchhiked to Canton. Uh, St. Lawrence University is along the Canadian border. Mm -hmm. And when we arrived, uh, our last ride was on top of a truckload of fertilizer. <laughs> so he brought me into the dean's office, and I don't, didn't smell very well. <laughs> and the dean was, was sniffing, and he didn't believe my. I wanted. I said I wanted to go to college. I have one hundred sixty-six dollars. But I also had my papers from high school, and I won best speaking prize, best essay prize. So I had a pretty good record. Mm -hmm. So he said, "Okay, we'll take a chance on you." <laughs> so I went to college. It's terrific. Um, after that, how did you end up at the? American Academy of Dramatic Arts. What was the, how did that? How did you swing well, that one? You see, you remember, <laughs> I wanted to be an actor 
when I was in second grade right. in the state. So uh, I thought I should go to a, a good acting school. So I went to New York and was a, that's a difficulty because I always didn't have money. <laughs> But they take it, took me in, and I went to the American Academy of Dramatic Arts, uh, Spencer Tracy, Gaston Hepburn, lots of big stars had come from there. And I spent two years at the American Academy. And a young girl was there, Lauren Bacall, and she was, she, uh, I, I was in the senior class, and she was 15, 16 years old. He was in the junior class, and we became friends. And I had a thin coat that someone had given me, and it was winter. And she looked at the coast and thought, my God, he, I must be freezing. So she went to her uncle and talked him out of an uh, overcoat <laughs> and he gave it to me and I wore it for two years. <laughs> so That was the beginning of a beautiful uh, <laughs> friendship. McCall can't do no wrong. Right. <laughs> And at that time, she was she was Betty Joan Persky, right? Yes. <laughs> a question that I think will be of interest to a lot of people is, when and why did Isser Danielovich become Izzy Dembski and then Kirk Douglas? How did those changes come about? My original name is Isser Danielovich. When my parents immigrated, they never went, went to school, came to this country. My father had uh, brothers who had come here, and they were using the name Dembski. So we became, they have all patterns. We became, it's a Dempsey, as you know. And then it's a, became Izzy. Izzy became, uh, it ends the door. So, to me, when I think of myself as a kid who always is way inside of me, I think of a little Eastern. And then, uh, when I went to college, uh, one summer I had a job at a summer sack playhouse in the Adirondacks, a uh, Tamak playhouse. And that was the first job with Carla Molden and his wife Molden, who came from Chicago, worked there. And when I was working there, they all decided, you have to have a different name. <laughs> and everybody was Suggested a name in car suggested Kirk Douglas. Okay, <laughs> so I became Kirk Douglas, and when I went to New York, I had that legal life. So, you you were in New York and doing very well, and you get. So how does how how did you come to the attention of Hal Wallace? I think it comes back to Ms. Persky again, right? Well, <laughs> again, Lauren Bacall comes in the picture. <laughs> she already, of course, we skipped a lot of my life. Two years at the Rhode School. Uh, I did. I don't know how many plays. I did, but I want to digress to tell you mm -hmm. how insecure actors are. I had a part in a play that Pauline Kill, the big uh, critic, said, 
Kirk Douglas is nothing short of, a, of superb. And when I was, that night when I was in my, with my first wife, I said, I think nothing. Why did he do nothing? Why did he do nothing? <laughs> you know, Supper, right. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> so I have always remembered that. But during the, my two years as, as the American Academy of Dramatic Arts, I worked at the winter and I worked in the Grand Village house where I put on plays and they, they gave me a room. And I struggled, and then I started working on the stage. My first job in Broadway, I was an off-stage echo. <laughs> it was a big production, Catherine Cornell, Catherine McClancy directing, uh, uh, I think, Judith Anderson, Wow. Lots of people, mm -hmm. Edmund Gwen, and it's, it was Chekhov's Three Sisters. Mm -hmm. And there's a part of a young Russian soldier that I wanted to play. And he has a scene where he goes off to war and he, he says goodbye to the three around his house. And he looked out in the audience and he said, Yo ho! <laughs> I was off stage and I said, Yo ho! <laughs> I was the echo. <laughs> <laughs> that was my first part. <laughs> but I did maybe, of course, then I went to the Navy and when I, I had already done about Ten plays, no smashes, and then I was in the play, and Lauren McCoy was in Hollywood doing a movie with Humping Bogart, and there were the producers, Hal Wallace, who were going to New York, and she said, "Listen." When you go to New York, you must see an actor, Kirk Douglas. And again, she played a part in my life, and she, uh, he saw me and offered me a test to, in a picture with Barbara Stanwyck, uh, The Strange Love of Mark Ivers. And so uh, on the train going to Los Angeles, I kept studying my part. When I arrived, I realized I had studied the wrong part. <laughs> the, the part I was studying was half from play. I was going to play Barbara Sanders' wife. <laughs> uh, just before I ask you more about starting out in the movies, I just have to ask a question because when you were when you were coming up as an actor, that was a time when uh, some different new approaches to acting were becoming popular. For some of these guys, it was the method. For some of them, it was something else. For you, were you? Could you describe your? approach to acting in any way or would you or was it just whatever came naturally to you? I have studied Stanislavski, all the, the actor method. I have done almost 90 movies. My conclusion is acting depends and the saddest quality that you retain even in, when you grow up. Because if you look around, 
כן, ענת רייקסל, היא פריקה בו, היא פריקה איני, you just think of, a, of, the, uh, of the person you're playing and you become it. Mm -hmm. Acting in the child's profession. I don't agree with the complicated uh, uh, version of being an actor. You, you become Tyler. I'm a boxer. <laughs> I'm a soldier. Just, just in, become that person for a while. <laughs> I think that sounds right. Um, well, when you first arrived, when you got off the train out here, what was Hollywood the town? What were your first impressions of Hollywood the town? And then of the studio where you, the first studio that you went to to work at, I believe it was Paramount. Yeah. When I arrived, they said they would test the next day and they sent a limousine for me. And I was very impressed. <laughs> I sat in the limousine that morning to go to the studio. And then we approached the studio. I heard everybody, someone yelling, yelling. There was a truck. And there was a group of people all around the studio. And when we went through the gate, they booed. <laughs> I didn't know what was <laughs> happening. But there was a worker's truck. And I found the first day my director, Louis Milestone, was sympathetic to the strike. So he was at the corner of drugstore having <laughs> breakfast. So they had a, a substitute director. <laughs> and they kept me in the studio, sleeping there for three days. Because <laughs> You know, imagine I'm in New York, like, what the hell is <laughs> And now, I got the part, and we made the movie. Now, I, I've read a number of your, a lot of your other interviews and articles that, over the years, to, that, sort of to prepare for this, and I got the sense that that first movie was not a wonderful experience for a few different reasons, and I wonder if you can share... Yeah. Of course, uh, I went playing Barbara Stanford's husband. And then when the milestone we call Millie came back, he saw, I said, he said, Kirk, in this scene you must be smoking. He, I don't smoke. Well, you learn. <laughs> and, and I smoked in this scene. And I got sick and had to go to my dressing room. But I learned to smoke two, three packs a day. And thanks to Millie, my, my son. And I, I gave it up about 40 years ago. And let me tell you how I had a sap smoking. My father, who was above one, you know, really a tough guy. He used to smoke, and the doctor said, you're going to get, die, you keep smoking, so you better stop. So he had he stop. He kept one cigarette in the best pocket. When he felt the urge to smoke, he took out the cigarette and he said, Who's stronger? You, me, <laughs> I stronger. <laughs> I use the same method and I work <laughs> and I have this motion for the year. Amazing. Um, the other thing that I, I just quickly, Barbara Stanwyck wasn't, wasn't so lovely at first, right? Well, she was, first of all, she was a brilliant actress. But she was tough. 
I found her very friendly with the, in the stage crew, but she ignored me when playing in her husband. And after about two weeks, she said, she looked at me, she said, you know, Kirk, you're a good actor. I said, too late. <laughs> <laughs> With a <laughs> <laughs> um, is it correct that after that film, Wallace wanted to put you under a, a multi-year yes, contract? Yes. Uh, he, uh, as it was the cutman there, uh, they signed you up for seven pictures, seven years. Uh, Bert Lancaster had a such a contract. So he said, I only have you for four pictures. I want you to sign a seven year deal or I'll drop you. Somehow that made me mad. <laughs> so I said, drop me. And he did. <laughs> now I went without the contract, which was rare in those days, but I survived. And a few years later, Hal Wallace wanted me to play in a gunfight at Oak Ava with, with Bert Lancaster. And Bert said to me, Kirk, if I do this picture, it's my last picture and I'm out of the conflict. All right, so I did this. And I got paid about five times what <laughs> was the uh, put in that case. <laughs> that's that's movie. Yeah. <laughs> um, for the the next, I guess, two years, three years before Champion, you sort of a popped up in in a number of very good movies you weren't yet a big star but you were you were in some very good movies so just quickly i have to ask you uh out of the past i think verse unlike martha ivers where you'd been a little bit weak this was the first time we saw you as a tough guy and you know it's still considered one of the it's one of the film noir classics did did you like getting to be a, a tough guy well, uh, under the past, one of our missions was wonderful. And Dan Greer, I had a small part. I didn't think I was so tough until I did champion. Mm -hmm. Then I was Th a Then you were tough. tough. <laughs> <laughs> the other one that I just have to mention that was, I believe, just before champion was A Letter to Three Wives, where... Well, the, but that was a very good picture. I love that picture. I think I got nominated. No, you should have been, but it was... It, uh, they waited until Champ... They chose Champion instead. They were the same year, so it was for... It was for Champion instead. Was that the way? Yeah, but... I forgot that was a long time ago. That's all right. <laughs> but I, you know what? I rewatched this morning just... In preparation, we have this great, I'm, you probably, you're very up on your technology, I know. So, YouTube, I went and pulled up the, your your uh, diatribe in A Letter to Three Wives where you get very angry about the radio and advertising. You, do you remember, and, and I thought you, that was such a great uh, show-stopping scene. Do you remember where you... That was very good. You were... <laughs> but... But as you say, the 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 one that really made yeah, you a stop. I want to interrupt. You said you assume that I know about YouTube. <laughs> I don't know anything. <laughs> I have one computer that my wife gave me. Mm -hmm. All I know how to do, and I do it every day, is play spider salad. <laughs> and I don't have a cell phone right. because I think I feel sad for kids. 
they just, you know, my grandchildren uh, have a, a, a dinner for them. They're all... <laughs> right. Well, I have to... This is a big one, the next question, which is... Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, wait. Right. <laughs> no, but... Uh, Champion was the one that, that, as you say, made you a star. But, but your agents said don't do it, right? They thought I was crazy. <laughs> he said that he's just a New York actor because Stanley Clayman producing uh, Champion had no money. They offered me, uh, I think, $15,000. The agent had me starting with Ava Gardner and Gregory Peck in a, what, what the, the Great it? Center. The Great Center. Right. And when I turned that down, they were flabbergasted <laughs> because I turned it down because I wanted to play a tough guy. So, champion, a boxer. And of course, it became very successful, and it was a big thrust to my career. Now, why do you think you wanted to play a tough guy so badly? I mean, if you think about Midge, he he would you could call him selfish, you could call him cocky, you could call him cold. He leaves pretty Ruth Roman, you'd just ditch her. So why? But yet. There was something that you must have connected to in the character. Yes, because I'm, I'm not such a nice guy. <laughs> so, you know, I, don't want, I didn't want to be playing the role of Barbara Sandwich. Husband. Right. <laughs> I wanted to be her lover, right. <laughs> but I had to get rid of the husband. <laughs> Right. Um, also, though, I've I've heard you talk about the fact that there's one line that Midge sa says, or his, I guess, yeah, that he says that you really related to at that time in your life about how he wants to be regarded by others. Oh, I want a, I want people to call me Mister. Not another hey you, right? <laughs> It was, I'm not going to be a hey you all my life. I want to hear people call me me. <laughs> That's great. So, my God. 60 years it's old. unbelievable. <laughs> 60 years oh, it's amazing. So, now that film was, and your performance were so well received. The movie was a hit. You got your first Oscar nomination. Suddenly, you're this big star. How did you handle this change? It must have been a pretty sig big change in your life. Yes. The big change in your life, and you got, get a lot more money for <laughs> playing a part. Right. And, you can, and it was encouraging me, which I later did, to start my own company. That uh, champion was a star. Yes. Um, now, just quickly, you you mentioned that you've always had a uh, you always had a strained relationship with your own father, and that he he saw champion, and you went to him for feedback. Well, you know, of course, in Amsterdam, New York, there is a who became Kirk Douglas, <laughs> was now famous. Right. So after I did a champion, because my father never paid attention to me. And as Michael said, Dad is still looking for a pat on the back from his father. Mm -hmm. So I went to Amsterdam, my father was now not living with her family, and I, I saw him 
in Bazi Saloon. Mm-hmm. It's afternoon, I came in. Hi, guys. <laughs> uh, I did a picture that Captain, yeah. Did you see it? Yeah? Do you like it? Yeah. Well. That was it. That was my meeting <laughs> with my father. He was not impressed. <laughs> well, um, you, as you say, though, suddenly now you had the power to say yes and no to things uh, that you, it was, the ball was now in your court. And I know that one thing that was happening at, at that time that was threatening the movies was the the arrival of television. And so the studios would tell their actors, don't have anything to do with television. And what did you have to say in response to that? Yeah, I use some cuss words. No, I think you just went on television and... Sh and <laughs> listen, I didn't, li I didn't listen to Tudor when I didn't have a power. Right. <laughs> when the Al Wallace wanted to send me as a F you. <laughs> I, I promise we won't spend the as much time on every movie as as we did on Champion, but I have to just touch upon a number of the other ones that will always be associated with you and that people still love. And I think the first one uh, that I want to do after Champion, Young Man with a Horn, suddenly, again, Betty Joan Persky, now you're in a movie with her. Uh, and I wonder, you. it was really the first in this wave of movies that incorporated jazz. Was that a fun one for you to do? First, let me tell you. Yesterday, I talked to my son, Michael. Mm -hmm. He was at the United Nations. They had a meeting of all Quincy Jones, all jazz musicians. And he said, Dad, I met a guy from Africa who won the Papa the world best trumpet player. <laughs> and he said to me, you know, after I saw your father in Young Man with his horn, I began to study the trumpet. Amazing. And I think Michael was more impressed than <laughs> I was. <laughs> but, was it, uh, of course, uh, Betty, who go baby long recall and Doris Day within it. And Betty had a line I still remember. Uh, I was just an uh, intellectual monk of go, leaping from crack to crack. <laughs> and I will always think Betty let me see you say the word. <laughs> I thought they were, they were most, the most difficult word right. to say out of the <laughs> But and they were fun. And Harry James, uh, you know, I'm not sure they did. I learned a lot. I learned to play one or two songs mm -hmm. with. Interesting. To, to ensure the veracity. Yeah. Is that a yeah. That's a very good yeah. word. Yeah. <laughs> um, You're pulling out all the dictionaries. Yeah. <laughs> the next year, uh, you and Billy Wilder made Ace in the Hole, which I think, I don't know if it was in Europe it was called the Big Carnival, but here it was Ace in the Hole. Well, they were so, you know, someone to do a dumb. Yeah. <laughs> I'm ace in the hole was a perfect title. Mm -hmm. Well, let's see, we'll call it the big kind of <laughs> I always call it ace in the hole. And I thought it was a very good picture. Mm -hmm. And I thought that Billy Wilder was such a brilliant director. Mm -hmm. Um. I, I believe at one point, you know, your character, again, in this case, uh, 
well, I should say, you, as you sort of referred uh, or indicated a little while ago, you didn't mind playing unlikable characters. In this case, this guy was very unlikable, and you at one point asked Billy Wilder, should you tone it down a little bit? And what did he say? Both <laughs> Give him both right. <laughs> did another movie that is on every list of especially of the film noir the greatest movies but on, i've seen it on top 100 all-time list just a great movie detective story mm -hmm. and i think that that actually a lot of people believe inspired all of the police procedurals that we now see law and order uh all these different crime dramas that now happen so for for you here again not a not a especially lovable guy was that a good one for you, a fun one for you? Virtue is not polygenic. <laughs> so I like to play yeah. bad guys. Right. Sure. Whenever I play a bad guy, I try to find something good in him. Mm -hmm. And that kept my contact with the audience. Uh, as in who, what it was. I would look here. I, I, I work with so many good directors. Mike Witt, Kazan, Billy Wilder. Medellin. I'm lucky. Yeah, yeah. Um, so where were we? Well, that was just detective story. Do you have any? Memory? I know you. I know you enjoyed. I in your in your book here. I read about working with. Lee Grant, who had had her own issues during the blacklist. Yes, Lee Grant. I think she played the small part, a shoplifter in uh, the detective story. If I'm not mistaken, she got the mm -hmm. uh, Oscar nomination. Absolutely. She was, she was a wonderful girl. And years later, she directed Michael and me and all our ones in the family picture. I remember that. And I just have to point out a statistic that I put together. Somebody may have done this before, but I haven't seen it. You must have been a great scene partner because you managed to bring out the best in so many people that even though the Academy never got it right, and gave you an Oscar, three of your co-stars won Oscars for their performances opposite you. And I just have to tell you, Gloria Graham for The Bad and the Beautiful, Best Supporting Actress, Anthony Quinn for Lust for Life, Best Supporting Actor, Peter Ustinov for Spartacus, Best Supporting Actor. I don't know how many other people have... Hey, this is no, no, no more nice guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You know who's good in bringing the best of his fellow actors is my son, Michael. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and fellow actors. Yeah. Especially with women. They yeah. all were wonderful. <laughs> um, the, the next year, after, after doing Ace in the Hole and Detective Story in the same year, which it would be enough for some careers, the next year... You did The Bad and the Beautiful, which is, a lot of people say, probably the best movie ever made about movies. Yes. You know, it's tough to make a movie about movies. My, la my last book, Iron Sparkers, is about the making of the, of the movies. Mm -hmm. 
and there, there rarely had been a successful movie about making a movie. Why do you think that is? Well, too close to it. Yeah. But Batman the Beautiful was very good. And Leonard Turner, I think, did his best job. Absolutely. He was very good. I was good. Too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, were, was your portrayal of this ruthless producer, was that based on anyone that actually worked in the business? Me. The, you, 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 really? Yeah. No, I, I didn't. I didn't have a... Certain person in mind. Mm -hmm. I just played the part right. with a very interesting, interesting character. And you got your second Oscar nomination. Yes. So that's that must have been nice. Uh, that same year was The Big Sky and Howard Hawks. You're talking about great directors that you worked with. He, what did you make of working with him? He was. People always said he was like a, a guy's guy. Is that true? We, we did Big Sky with Howard Hawks in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Beautiful country. And we all lived in tents. And Howard Hawks would take us down. We sat in we the thing, you know. Everyone got to take five. He did, with a, a pen, and he rewrote the scene now. Because suppose you said, you don't, don't do it. <laughs> and then he would rewrite the scene, and he would play it. He was a good, he, he directed Better Be Call in uh, To Have or Have. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And, I or the big, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think that's something to the same when I think of Kirk Douglas, I think it's a Daniel. Yeah. <laughs> um, and he got you to sing. Oh, whiskey, leave me alone. Oh, whiskey, leave me alone. Yeah. That was, was pretty good. And I, I, I remember reading that I think there was, a, there was some stunt or something in the movie involving the, the, the rope on a horse that John Wayne had refused to do in another movie with Hawks because he didn't think he could make it could be funny. But he saw that you did it, and after that, John Wayne said to him, if you ask me to be in a funeral because it will be funny, I'll believe you. Like after you, <laughs> So that, you, you were impressive with that one. But um, I believe that your most commercially successful movie ever was 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, is that right? Probably. And I sang in that. Yeah. <laughs> for a guy who, who can't sing, I sang a right. <laughs> God of will of the hills will tell you that. Uh, <laughs> now that, did you do that because you had young kids that they, they might enjoy it? Oh, I gave them all uh, a cup of this song. Yeah. All the young kids at that time knew that song. Mm -hmm. And they must have loved, your own kids must have loved yes. seeing you in that one. When they made the, a disc of it professionally. Yeah. And I maintained, I said in the interview that my friend Frank Sinatra was jealous of me. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you then, I guess it makes sense that after having your most commercially successful movie, you did, that was the time that you chose to do something that very few other actors had done. I believe at that point, maybe the only one that, that had done it was your friend Burt Lancaster, which was to start your own production company. Yes. Why did you choose to do that? Well, yeah, I wanted the opportunity to find some project that I wanted to do. So I started my own company and I called it Brunner. 
As for my mother, <laughs> man, think of my mother who can't read or write a legal president from Russia. I take care in the limousine at Times Square and in the middle I stop the car and I say, see ma, Brenna, the name I told you to write, Brenna presents the Viking. <laughs> and my mother says, America, such a wonderful life. <laughs> um, and, and some of the some you made at at Bryna Productions. You made some of your best films that you were a part of. I I know that just to quickly highlight the fact that during with with that company, Paths of Glory, The Viking, Spartacus, Lonely Are the Brave, Seven Days in May. So before I ask you specifically about any of those, do you think those films could have been made? by a regular studio or would have been made or did they need somebody that was willing to do them in an independent way like your production company did? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Paths of uh, Glory, uh, probably not. Mm -hmm. Paths of Glory, probably oh, not. Oh no, Paths of Glory, no. Paths of Glory, I saw a picture, a little picture that Stanley Kubrick had done. I said, I think he's very talented. Mm -hmm. I called him, he said, do you have any other project? He said, I have a project, nobody wants to do it. And he sent me a for glory. <laughs> I said, Stanley, this picture won't make a nickel, mm -hmm. but we have to do it. <laughs> and I ran to do it. And it, it, it keeps increasing in popularity. Mm -hmm. Easier. Absolutely. Especially now that you can see it in certain countries like France. Yeah. yeah it was <laughs> banned yeah. in France yeah. for 15 years. Mm -hmm. Crazy. Um, before you did Paths of Glory, though, between when you for in 55 is when you formed the production company, in 57 is when Paths of Glory came out, but in between, you did the movie that I think a lot of people still associate with you more than any other movie, Lust for Life. And uh, I just have to ask you, you've written that, that you, quote, never had a movie take so much out of me, close quote. Why? You know, acting is make-believe. I never believe the Kevin. I, I want you to believe. Mm -hmm. But you know, Lust for Life, I got so involved with Van Gogh. I read his letter to Seal, and I really was fretting because I felt like the characters were overtaking me. It said me that the character was guiding me. Uh, and it was a very, very interesting experience. I have never felt that way in any other picture. But I thought it was a good picture. It was nominated for Oscar, but it did win. Just, I think it's worth noting, though, that you, when you made the picture, you were the same age as Van Gogh was when he committed suicide. And also, we made the picture at all the locations mm -hmm. where Van Gogh and uh, the Jean the Yellow House and Ah, uh, you can see over so while I slept in, in the bedroom when he died. And you looked a lot like him. Yes, yes, that was surprising. It was my beer I made it run, and, and I looked lots of like him. You know, we had a big charity ball at, at Monte Carlo, and all the actors were doing songs, and I got a, a big empty frame. And I went, I, I, I took it like this, and I just walked like a living, a big head, like a living portrait. I, 
have heard you talk just one one last thing about Lust for Life. You mentioned that uh, the shoes that you wore and the way that you wore them really helped you to to develop that character. Well, I just had one shoe. I always had the laces loose. And my wife, for sure, would say when I was so shooting coming home, she can hear me suffering. Interesting. Now, chronologically, is where Paths of Glory comes in. And uh, why do you think, why did it take so many years for that great, very disturbing story to become a movie? Why did it take so long? Well, it, it was banned in France. And some, some people don't want to see a movie that downgrades war. And, but eventually it found its niche. And I think it has, it has been very popular. Perhaps one of the great, great war movies. And I guess, though, what it's, in a lot of ways, one of the things that it's remembered for, aside from your terrific performance, is the fact that you have this young, you chose to have this young director come in and do it as his first sort of major film. Why, what, what about Stanley Kubrick made you say, I want to work with this guy? Stanley Kubrick was very difficult. But he was very talented. So I saw his talent outweighed his difficulty. Mm -hmm. And it did. And eventually he, he directed it. Right. Um, but was he, were, were there any major issues? involving him on Paths of Glory. I know there were for Spartacus, which we'll get to, but with Paths of Glory, was the production itself a pretty smooth one? Well, you know, it was very close to the war. And uh, let me tell you a story. <laughs> there was a German at the gate holding Chain that was less and anybody in it until he knew that. Now, we was the, the big picture at that time shooting in Gaza's guest site. I would come with my drive to the day, he would keep the water, then, then love the, he, he dropped the wire, the chain. I got so annoyed. The next morning I said to Robert, if you stop at the water, you're fired. <laughs> I said, go right through. <laughs> then I was there, there like, looked like a Nazi with the wire. <laughs> Boom! I stopped. Then I went back to him and said, you recognize me? Yes. I, am I here every morning? Yes. Will never have the stand up when I... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. That's fine. Sometimes I can be difficult. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so now we get to the main course, Spartacus. Um, how did you... And I know that a lot of these questions I know the answer to from reading the book, but just to remind people and preview the book a little bit, how did you first hear about the book Spartac that inspired Spartacus? And then were you immediately convinced after you read it that it, would, that it could be a great movie, or did you have your doubts yourself? My doubts about what? That it could be, a, a, that it could be made into a great movie. Oh, what? Well. It was, to me, it was a natural. See, Spartacus was a, a real character. Not much is written about him because the Romans were embarrassed that this slave almost overthrew the Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. And 
like like today, there's so many revolutions of slaves, if you want, the poor people against the, the authority. And I went in three with the character of, of Spartacus, and I, I just had to make it. And at the same time, we were going through a terrible period of, of uh, McCarthy era. It was terrible, terrible. I mean, people were put in jail. Uh, my book starts with the hearing, and of course, Stop me from overall is probably the most brilliant writer at that time. He he was sentenced to a year in jail. Of course you know the story uh, how the the head of the studio created a blacklist and you got worn out, suppose employed them or it, when you did, they, they used uh, a, a, a pseudonym. Uh, when I think of it, it hurts me. Mm -hmm. uh, because that was, good. as I say in my book, I inspired this making a film breaking the blacklist. Absolutely. And I try to really give the details of making the film, and it's a spoiler story. Uh, I mean, uh, Steven Spielberg, who loved the book, he said, boy, the problem you have, I thought I had a problem making Zorn. <laughs> and then, of course, combination we're breaking the black face. Well, w what was interesting is that I think Howard Fast, right, had been had, had been accused himself of being a communist. Yes, but he... He admitted. He admitted that he was a... Yes, he got out of it, and then he wrote a few patriotic books. <laughs> <laughs> but he... As part of the terms for for making a movie out of the book, you you mentioned that he insisted at, at first on writing the script. I, 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 I bought an option in the book, but he insisted that he write the book, write the script. So he started, and I thought it was awful. <laughs> Just a long speech. So who was the best writer for it? Dalton Trumbo. <laughs> and he had been living in Mexico. He had come back here. And we made a deal with him. And I would have think like all the, And I would give him this name of or oh, he gave himself the name of Sam Jackson. Mm -hmm. So we had Howard Fast writer and Sam Jackson. <laughs> and we would tell Howard Fast that it was Eddie Lewis who <laughs> worked for me right. at his trip. So we give <laughs> Howard a uh, John Zumbler script to Howard Fast, who wrote it? Eddie Lewis. <laughs> and he doesn't know anything <laughs> about writing this in a mess. When I told what? Donald Trump, he just left. Yeah. And, and if it had become widespread knowledge during the making of the film that Trumbo was actually writing it, what would have happened? Well, at the beginning, what would happen is that studio, the studio would close the pictures down. And this is universal? 
See, of course, when they got too far down the road and about eight million, <laughs> see, the picture cost 12 million dollars. Well, at that time, yeah. that's 50 years ago, yeah. was a lot of money. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, y you had, when, when the, when the uh, Hollywood 10 and all of that was first taking place, you were just starting, I don't even think you had arrived, or you were just coming up in Hollywood at that time. Yeah. Um, did you know people who at that time were personally affected by it? And also, how did you feel? I mean, it was a di there, was, there was a sense that communists might be inserting propaganda into movies. What did you make of all this at the time? Well, I was young, ambitious, and I thought that, I thought that was all stupid and would blow over. But it didn't. And you ask me, people that hurt were involved and uh, what can you get the name that comes up better because long because yeah. she went with her husband uh, Humphrey Bogart with a group to protest in Washington at the meeting this was the Mobile. Committee for the First Amendment, right? That was the... Yes, of course. Yeah. It's, you know, it's, it's like what's happening sometime right now. I mean, it, it's hard for me to speak about mm -hmm. it because the blacklist was one of the most embarrassing things in my art history, when people were, uh, like, people are, are not supposed to think, yeah, sensory what you think, which of course is in the Constitution. I think so, no? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, as the, as the, not only the star, but the producer, it was, as you talk about in the book, it was largely on your shoulders to put together this cast and also to get the director, choose a director. And there were, you, we end up, the film that people can see today has this incredible cast and everybody knows that the director was Stanley Kubrick and that you were the star. But what they don't necessarily know is that there was a time when somebody else wanted to play Spartacus, when somebody else was directing it, when somebody else was playing the Gene Simmons part. So I wonder if you can, uh, without, that's all, in, that's the all in here, right. But the, the gist of it was that uh, in terms of, you, were you always, always gonna play Spartacus or did somebody, <laughs> did somebody try to push his way in? <laughs> Let me go back. Okay. I bought a book from Ken Kesey. Yeah. Called One Flow of the Cuckoo's Nest. I was thought it was wonderful. And I love the character of McMurphy. Mm -hmm. I bought it. Nobody has seen two interests, so I thought I'll make it in the play because. I said all we want is to go back to the stage. I paid the Wasserman to make in the play. When we went out of town, we were a big hit. Mm -hmm. We came back to the north. <laughs> they were indifferent. I, I, I played it for, I think, five months. And then I came back to Hollywood to make it into a movie. For 10 years, I couldn't make it a movie. My son was coming out of uh, this, the TV show with Carl Baldwin, Streets of San Francisco. He said, Dad, 
Then I tried to do something. I said, if I can't do it, okay. I gave it to him. In one year, he got the money, the cash, and I thought, boy, now I will play my part. <laughs> then he said, the directors think you're too old. <laughs> I'm too old, I mean, my... Anyhow, <laughs> I never played the part. Right. Jack Nixon plays it, and I went to see it once. How lousy he was. <laughs> and he was brilliant. Yeah. He was much better than I would have been, I think. <laughs> and of course, he went to Alaska. Right. Interesting how, th and also just for for as long as we're talking about parts that you didn't play but almost played, I believe that you at one time were looking at Stalag Seventeen and Cat Baloo, right? Why do you insist <laughs> bring out bring out the, the dumb thing that I did? That was one of the dumbest things I ever did. <laughs> Billy Wilder wanted me to play in Stella 17. I read the script. Well, I didn't think. I turned it down. He got Will, Will Holden and he <laughs> went on that. <after>. Right. <laughs> so, whatever, whatever, what other examples do you have of what I. Well, the other big one was only only Cat Baloo, right? That was the only other one. I, <laughs> I forgot that. Again, no, I don't want to play. Someone else win the <laughs> Um Well, but coming back to to Spartacus, which I think the year that that was released was the year that Jack Lemon won Best Actor for The Apartment. I don't know. I mean, I think Spartacus is hard to compete with, but anyway. But but with that, you the, the point I just wanted to make is that you almost, in order to get Olivier to, to be in the film with you, you had, he, he, he thought at one time he was going to play Spartacus, right? Oh. And direct. A and direct, right. Yes. You see, the script was perfect. Olivier... Bill, Bill Russo and Charles Lawson. Mm -hmm. And Dean Simmons, who I don't know where she got a script at the beginning, was so anxious to play Berlina. But I didn't take Dean Simmons because I said, Dean, you're English. The slave cannot be English. <laughs> So I was trying to get a foreigner to play and, and lots of things mm -hmm. happened before I finally capitulated and got <laughs> Dean Simmons and right. she was wonderful. Mm -hmm. And you have a very funny, I won't make you tell it, but just so people know that in the book, you, uh, when you, she had to do a nude scene and she said you were very convincing at getting getting her to do it. Well, we had a bathing scene. And, and she was wearing a bra and panty. We, of course, we, we, we should have been in the nude. And then Stanley said to me, talk to her. I mean, because she had to say down in the water, otherwise they see the bra. I said, Jean, <laughs> take off the bra. <laughs> you, I said, you know, you, you, your bosom will be born in there, will just see a little bit so they know you don't have a, a, a bra. She looked at me and started to laugh. I said, what's so funny? She said, Kirk, I bet you were good 
and getting girls to take off their bra. <laughs> but she took it off and so they, she had a beautiful breast and we played the scene. Um, the last question, just uh, in terms of personnel on that movie, why did, why did originally, you, you, you were sort of imposed, Anthony Mann was imposed upon you, you weren't so into it, so how did it wind up that he was replaced by Kubrick? I did, when we were trying to get a, a, a director, the studio suggested as his man, I said, no, he's wrong, he has done what's his body. His picture was so su successful. They insisted, so we started with Anthony's man. After about three weeks, the studio said, Kirk, you're right, he's wrong, I have to fire him. Well, uh, I'm no Donald Trump. <laughs> I, I, I hate. But I did, but he was so gracious. And I said, I owe you a picture. And a few years later, I did a pic with him. Well, now, who can, who to replace him? Stanley Kubrick was working with Modern brand and one eyed Jack. At the same time, Modern brand new fire Kubik and took over the director himself. Mm -hmm. I called Kubik, I will give you a scene and a script. Read it now, see what I want to do with the director. All over the weekend. One morning, I was the new director, <laughs> Santa Coupe. And I think the, the best, well, the most famous scene, I think it's fair to say, in Spartacus is, well, you know what I'm going to say. I am Spartacus. I am Spartacus. I am Spartacus. And I never knew until I read your book how that all came together. And that the idea that Stanley Kubrick didn't even want to entertain the idea of that. It was your idea, and he didn't want to have anything to do with it. Well, we had many. And you the I won, because I was a boy. Right. But, but Stanley was wrong there, but he was right in a lot of other places. He's a difficult guy. But he was a great director. And of course, that was, uh, I put my book, and my spring in my book too much, too often. No, no <laughs> I don't want, I don't want to think to act like I'm seven in the book. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, but, I guess looking back, I know you. Yeah. S wait a yeah. Uh, what, the <laughs> <time. laughs> uh, forward is by George Clooney. Awesome! That was great. Okay, I'm finished selling. <laughs> no, we'll come. We'll sell some more in a bit. But okay. Uh, but uh, what? Where did that idea come from for that scene? I am Spartacus. I am Spartacus. I am Spartacus. And and why? I know you just you just watched the film again recently. You mentioned in the book. You can see it's people. If you watch it with an audience, that is the most I think as powerful as maybe except for the last scene where your where your child. But yeah. <laughs> but did you know? Just what's the story behind that scene? Because it's really great. How can you best portray the love that people had for their leader? Everybody was willing to die for Spartacus. And, and, and that's a certain scene. You know, and, and Olivier 
didn't know how to deal with it. Mm -hmm. It went Spartacus and everybody to say, I'm... Have you ever been able to go a day in your life when you're out in public without somebody asking you to, <laughs> to say, I am Spartacus? <laughs> it's probably... It's nice to make a movie that people enjoy and that does something. Absolutely. Um, and, and then just the, the tail end of the Spartacus story, which is what you will, you know, it might be remembered even longer than any of the movies, is the fact that at the end of the day you did put the name of Dalton Trumbo on the film. And when, when, you, when you told him that you, that you were going to do that, uh, he, had, he had recently said, the heck with the movie because people were re rewriting lines and all of this stuff. But you told him that and he was very moved, wasn't he? Well, you know, I mean, that was such a terrible thing that the blacklist really is a shameful thing. But I think if I were much older at that time, I might not have done it because I was young enough to be, you know, stubborn. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, when you get older, you get more conservative as well. Why doesn't someone else do it? <laughs> Why is there people who say, Kirk will never work in this? But when you're young enough, you have that, but that you always, to do it. But you always fought injustice. Mm -hmm. You always reacted to injustice. Well, that seems... And hypocrisy. I have mm -hmm. a But it, it's right. Now, it's just wrong. I mean, we are in America. My mother always said, America, that's a wonderful land. Well, but at that time, it was not a wonderful land. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think, again, the, the Kubrick wanting to take the credit. Oh, yeah. Well, there was a time where, yeah, so maybe I think it's worth mentioning, Kubrick was ready to, very happy to have his name put on it. Well. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> I forgive for that. Right. I forgive when people have talent. <laughs> but was was Trumbo very grateful for what you did? I have a letter that he wrote to me saying you'll be Well you see in the book right. the facsimile of the Johnny right. Get Your Gun page right. that they reproduced. Right. Yeah, and he, he thanked me. I took that thank you for giving me back my name. Mm -hmm. It went very touching. The, the last movie that I want to just quickly ask you about is one that I believe you say is your personal favorite of your movies, and that is Lonely... Lonely on the Brain. Right. Um, why is it your personal favorite? I love the character. Again, Golden Trumbo wrote the screenplay. Mm -hmm. One time, it would never change the word. It was perfect, mm -hmm. like a hole in one. And we said, I love that character and the relationship with his horse. And I always considered that my best movie. It was not a big success. It, it can to be more of a cult film right now. Boy, I love it. But Scott, uh, Dalton yeah. Trumbo was writing that film, was starting that, and then Kirk took him off that to oh, write okay. Spartacus. Interesting. They yes. already had the relationship. Interesting, okay. So that's how you knew him. Um, I, I just watched Lonely Are the Brave again for the first time in a while this week, and then I wanted to read what I read what a lot of other you know, critics and people, what they, how they, what they interpreted it to be about, as opposed to just 
the surface story. And people were suggesting that maybe it's about a guy resisting conformity. He is trying to remain an individual in a world where it's harder to do that these days. Is that what you saw in the story that you responded to? Because that really is also, in a way, the story of Spartacus and of uh, Champion and of a lot of the movies. You know, a one guy going his own way. Well, if I do a movie just on, on me, that will be the main thing. Yes. Freedom. Freedom of expression, freedom, you know, in, in our country right now, that's the most important thing. All over the world, they're rebelling against leaders who, who kill you. So. Freedom of, of, of expression is the most important thing because people are, are saying what they think. And when I country denies that, it will be a sad day. So I am very proud that Spartacus book of the blacklist because that was very important. But as I said, I know that it happened at the right time for me that I was young enough to be fooled. <laughs> if I older, well, let's, let's think about it. You know? <laughs> well, the very last little bit is that I just want to bother you about a couple of thoughts uh, big picture questions. Just um, first of all, the 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 third act of your life in a way. You've had to deal with a lot of difficult things, with your own health, with loss, with different things. And so I wonder, people. You know, you. So many people say how much they admire the fact that after the stroke, you actually maybe kept going harder. Some people would lay down and and quit, but you have kept, you know, kept at it more than anybody. And I just wonder, do you remember, what do you remember of the stroke itself and why have you been able to per persevere? What do I remember? I was there. But do, is it something that you consciously remember or do you kind of conk out? Listen. He wrote a book? Yeah. Listen. I wrote the book? Mm-hmm. Pacemaker. Helicopter crash, stroke, what does it mean? God doesn't want me now. <laughs> That's all. Yeah. You know, you have to have some inner philosophy to deal with so adversity. But I realized how lucky I was in many ways. Years, years before that, I was all set to go with Mike Todd on his private plane to give him a war in New York. My wife had an argument with me and I, I said, my old I won't go. He didn't want to go, wanted me to go. Next morning we heard all the radio. My son, all his passion is killed. Why was I spared there? In the helicopter crash, two people were killed. I broke my back. See, so you have to be grateful for miracles in your life, and you have to try to do something to balance it. 
and I, it was interesting that I know another one of your books there, and there's for people that are curious, there's now, I think 10 total. Um, another one of your books, you talk about the fact that you have, you, I think you say you're not more religious, but you're more spiritual as you've gotten older. And I just wonder, uh, you know, I know you've at, at, at 83, you had a second bar mitzvah because I guess 70 is sort of rebirth. And now in a few more months, I believe you're scheduled to have another bar mitzvah. Um, wh- how ha- I'm alive at 96, six months from now, mm-hmm. I will have my second, third, third. my third. third bar mitzvah. But Why is that important to you? I'm not religious. Mm-hmm. Be- well, it's important to me because I am proud of my heritage. When I read the history of the Jews, it's a miracle. Why are we still here? And and I I think religion in general has been a bad thing. I think all religion should modernize. We are basing the religion as something that was written thousands of years ago. In my, my, for example, Orthodox Jews, women are separated. I don't believe that. Uh, Muslim believe that women are separated. The women that got the vote in about, what, 1920? I mean, <laughs> now that modern race, that's just a real meaning. I believe in God, <laughs> but I don't know who he is. If people say man was created in well, the God was created in man's image that he brought to the bathroom. I mean, <laughs> I think, see, when I look at a flower, it makes me believe in God. But I don't know. I just think uh, God is uh, some power that we can't understand. People make up stories, but did anybody really come back? Uh, that's, that's a, this is subject. It's too long. <laughs> but so th- the future, though, for the country, we have this election that's coming up, a pretty big presidential election, Romney Obama. Uh, so the in terms of the country, and then personally, as you look at the future, are you optimistic? Are you pessimistic? You know that. What do you? How do you feel going forward? I am always optimistic. I will be more optimistic if Obama is re-elected mm-hmm. for a second term. Mm-hmm. I think he has done a good job under the first condition. I think he was to do much more. And I hope I am first an American and I want whatever is good for our America. And the last question, what would you like and you can here I told you we're gonna do one last selling. So if you take the book, <laughs> what would you like people, especially young people who, who read I Am Spartacus your your new and latest of the 10 books you've written, what would you like them to take away from it? Be an American. You know, I have learned so much from my helicopter crash than from my stroke. Because first of all, you learn 
the thing can always be worse. <laughs> I'm <Sorry>. here. <laughs> I don't speak as well as, as I used to, but my wife said that there's too much talking anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no, and I have, look, I, I'm just finishing a book. I call the book My Stroke of Luck. And in it, I try to maybe help other people with handicaps. For example, depression. I know depression, there's lots of scientific causes of it, but I think one of the big causes of depression is narcissism. Mm -hmm. You are thinking too much about yourself. Mm -hmm. You have to start thinking about other people and other things, and you get, and that's the way I got out my, my, my depression. So when it first happened to you, you were depressed. You thought, why me? Uh, God, why me? And uh, what am I going to do now? Well, what is an actor who can't talk? You know, and at the beginning, I couldn't talk at all. Then, then I started to study with a speech therapist. And Michael, we were, Michael and I were always going to do a movie together. So Michael said, well, Dad, you keep working with your speech therapist, and then we'll do the movie. I got mad and said, Michael, why don't you work with well my speech therapist? <laughs> <laughs> and then I said, and then, Michael, when you talk the way I talk, we'll do the movie. <laughs> So, I mean, it's, it's the basic fact is that you had to learn how to speak again. Yes, yes. You know, when you think of it, we talk, all you people, you, you talk. You think of something and you say it, and you never think what is required to... I had to learn to make every sound. Yes. And, you know, but... The frustrating thing is, my thoughts are here, but my speech is crawling around. So it gets frustrating. If you're like me, you can't begin to imagine what working in Hollywood for more than a half a century is like. You also wonder how, after a devastating and debilitating stroke, iconic actor Kirk Douglas was able to overcome the resulting physical and emotional challenges and continue his work as an actor, author, and philanthropist. One thing's for sure, he didn't do it alone. Thanks to Anne, his wife and business partner, Kirk Douglas has been able to make movies and make a difference. I recently sat down with this remarkable couple in their Los Angeles home to discuss their personal and professional longevity and their lifelong commitment to helping others. Take a look. So, Kirk, I don't normally start interviews by saying, wow, but you deserve more than one wow. It's amazing, your body of work, the fact that you're the ever-ready bunny, you just keep going and going and going. So what are the characteristics about you? I am. A hundred years ago, I thought I would not be doing interviews, but I guess I, guess I was wrong. But I look back on my, I don't know, 50 years of making movies, and I'm satisfied. And what is it about him? Do you, what are the characteristics you see in him that uh, this? There are many phases. You know, uh, characteristic in his work, uh, in his philosophy and with women. Now, which one would you like? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you're a woman. Why don't we start there? <laughs> and uh, uh, I think with time, he has what I would say matured in the best way. Whatever he didn't have before, and I don't mean possession, 
uh, in, within him as a character, uh, he has it now, and he has it. Little by little, it came more and more. I'm listening to you, and I don't think this is probably me. <laughs> because I don't recognize myself. Everybody has their favorite Kirk Douglas movie, so I want to give uh, the two of you a crack at it. Is there a favorite film of yours? Do you have a favorite film? Did he ask you? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I have several movies. I, I have made almost 90 movies. God, that's a lot of movies. I don't want to make an, another movie. But the movie I like was not always the most popular movie. Uh, Lonely on the Moon. Yes. I, w I was sensitive for that title. Was well, it not a big movie? But I like the movie. I like the character I played in. You know, uh, Kirk's talked a lot about his youth and growing up poor, but your childhood helped shape who you are, too. I, I, can you talk a little bit about growing up and some of the things that you had to go through in, in your lifetime? My upbringing was that I spoke English, French, and German. And when I came to Paris, during the occupation, I was able to make some money by doing subtitles, German subtitles, under French movies. And later on, I continued to do the same thing with English subtitles under French movies. And it brought me into public relations. And, and uh, I became the uh, assistant of the assistant that took the stars to Hollywood. This was my dream of all dreams. I had a very interesting and fascinating life. I was in America taking the star for the Hollywood premiere about the uh, Toulouse Lautrec movie when the director who was a friend of mine wanted me for a movie with Kirk Douglas as the PR lady. And I said, I couldn't do it. I am going to Hollywood. <laughs> and that was more important than anything. I came back and uh, the director called and called and he said, I want you on the set tomorrow. And uh, he said, let me take you to the lion's den. And it was his dressing room. <laughs> and, and he came in and they, uh, they told me all about her. So she was the perfect for my assistant because she spoke three languages and I was very happy. So when she came in the office, the job, and she turned me down. Well, I was shocked. I, I was not 
a person to be treated that way. But then I took her to the charity ball where there's actually all foot and uh, the circus. There was an ex with elephants, and first axes were on the elephant. And when the elephant was at the end, it went off. I came out with a broom, and that, and that. In his tuxedo. And so that was the thing. That and made me really love. He said, if I could do, do that, so we will be much closer yeah. after that. <laughs> and 62 years later, here yeah. we are. Wow. We're still married. So that's the key to a great marriage. Yeah. Follow the elephants. Yes. <laughs> Let me ask you, all the philanthropic work that you do, is there one that's closest to your heart, the one that you feel the strongest about, Anne? I went with Kirk Thanksgiving to the homeless shelter. A friend of my husband wanted him to come along because Kirk had an experience in his youth about Thanksgiving, and his friend, Sidney Sheldon, a writer, said, you come with me and tell the men what uh, Thanksgiving meant to you. And Kirk had the speech and he, at Thanksgiving, was standing in line to try to get a meal, and they were running out of meals, just two people before him. So that was his story. While he was making the rounds and talked to the men, I looked, where are the women? Oh. The women are here, There's, everything is bunk beds. And then there came a white sheet, and that was for the women. All other facilities were the same. I was so appalled. I called the mayor who also helped me with the uh, a homeless now and gave some money. And I was trying to build a building because the facility for the man was already going to be replaced with a new facility because the earthquake had made it insecure. So I prayed a lot to God to see how I can find some money. But, Except, but you know, he prayed that God loved to God, but God doesn't have any money. <laughs> See, what was global to me. So yeah. God I called... make sure I kept working yeah. in the movie. So God called so Kirk. So he had enough money. And so God got called Kirk and a couple of his friends. <laughs> and I had my Ann Douglas sent a bill 22 years ago wow. for 28 in-house, 500 and more that come in and out for closing showers, 
Three right, right. movies. Three movies. <laughs> God told you to make three movies, oh, right? right. <laughs> uh, sitting here talking to the two of you, uh, you can't help but notice the love. And it's been there for years and years and years. And I want to talk about uh, 96. You got the Academy Award. Thunderous applause, standing ovation. You talked about your boys, how they were out in the audience and they were proud. But then you dedicated it to Anne and you told her you loved her. Talk to me about that moment. How important was that to confess your love to this woman that you've loved all these years? When the, the, the last girl, I gave her to her and I, it has never been in my room. It was always new. I have to tell you something that very few people know. The emotion about when he went to receive the actor, the Oscar, you have to know that my husband just had a stroke. He could hardly talk. He's taking speech lessons, and we're rehearsing at home. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all day long. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, he got that out. The night of the Oscar, now, we all know that he can say it. Thank you. It's the night of the Oscar. You saw it or you heard it. I am proud too. Proud to be a part of Hollywood for 50 years. But this is for my wife, Anne. I love you. The fact that he could say all this broke us totally with emotion. Somehow, somewhere, and we don't know to this day. He was in a corner in his room and said to himself, or learned these words that he said. We didn't know he could do it. What was that like for you? That must have been so amazing. So if you think it was not only the emotion that he gave it to me, but that he could talk. And I have been talking ever since. <laughs> Thank you both so much. This has just been an absolute delight. Thank you both. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. What a, what a pleasure.